I'm Edward October, creator host of October Pod on the Darkcast Network. I'm here to usher you through the creaking door into the Darkcast Network Halloween Sleepover. We've prepared tubs of hot buttered popcorn, and there's plenty of trick or treat candy. No razor blades, I promise, and lots of spirited beverages on hand. Enough for one sleepover anyway, but with the tales we'll be telling, there will be no sleeping. <laughs> While not all of the dark cast shows could be with us here at this slumberless party, those of us who are have brought with us some chilling tales of hauntings, urban legends, true crimes, personal stories of fear, and gore. So snuggle into your sleeping bags and grab someone or something to cuddle, because you dare not listen to these tales alone. Hey there, I'm CJ from Beyond the Rainbow Podcast. I'm also the founder and proud member of Darkcast Network. My show is about crimes committed by and against members of the LGBTQ community. If you're a member of the LGBTQ or an ally, then you are my peeps. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. Three years ago, I decided I needed to make a true crime podcast, but I wanted it to stand out, and I wanted it to be based on something I knew. I've been a lesbian all my life, and I knew that. I also noticed that there weren't many true crime podcasts based on the LGBTQ community. Oh sure, there were podcasts that every once in a while they do an LGBTQ case, but there weren't really podcasts that were dedicated just to LGBTQ crime. So I jumped headfirst into the LGBTQ true crime thing. And just recently I covered a serial killer case. It was a man who murdered gay men. As I recorded the episode, other than my normal issues of being tongue-tied, repeating myself, or hearing my odd mouth noises, there was nothing unusual about my recording. When I was done, I went and I walked my dog Nilla. Again, that's all very ordinary stuff for me. When I got back home, I put on my headphones, I sat on my couch, and I got ready to edit my episode. You know, removing the weird mouth noises, the ultra heavy breaths, and untimely belches. Because I drink bubbly stuff to make my mouth not so dry when I record, the bubbles lead to burping. (laughs) You know, the fun stuff. So there I was. I had edited through the killer's first four victims. Everything was going as planned with the episode. That is, until I got to the fifth victim. I heard an indistinguishable static. It almost sounded kind of like wind chimes were playing in the back. I highlighted a clip of it and I got a noise profile. And then I repeated the step to remove the sound. But I'll be damned, the sound would not delete. I had no choice but to leave it in. As I continued, I heard faintly a man's voice. It sounded as though he was saying, He did it. He killed me. I threw my headphones off. That was not my voice. Shaking, I got up and I walked around the house. I checked the locks on my doors and I made sure all my windows were shut and locked. Even though it was daylight out, I was still shaking. Maybe it was jitters from too much coffee, I'm not sure. But I decided to take a break from the editing and I went into the kitchen to do some dishes. When I was done, I went back into the living room picked up my headphones, sat back down in front of my laptop on the couch, and I put my headphones back on. I listened cautiously. There was no sound at all. Okay, good, because I didn't want any other sound. Bravely, I rewound my audio some, and I started to listen again to my episode. I got to the static part, and I strained to hear the voice again. And there it was. The voice sounded like a young man. He did it. He killed me. I fought through my fears and I listened to what was next. It was more static. 
And then the young man screamed. No! I was terrified. So again, I removed my headphones to compose myself and to try to figure out what the fuck was happening. I live alone aside from my pets. My nearest family or friends are hundreds of miles away from me. I have no one around who could be pranking me. Oh God, if only it were just a prank, I'd be so relieved. Again, I rewound the audio and I listened. Yup, I was hearing what I was hearing. I saved a copy and I tried again to remove the young man's voice, but it just wasn't going away. Ugh, I decided to just scrap the whole episode and to start researching and writing a new one. I opened my Word document program and the screen on my laptop froze. I used the task manager and I closed everything. When I opened up the program again to write, it froze. There was something in my life that was definitely amiss since I recorded that fateful episode. I decided to hell with this, and I put my podcast stuff aside for a while. I decided to go upstairs and color the gray out of my hair. I probably had 18 new grays as a result of what was happening with my recording. As I was putting the dye in my hair, I heard the man's voice again. It sounded like it came from behind me. He did it. He killed me. Soon I was looking in my mirror, talking to myself. Yes, I know he did. I was reporting on it. I assumed the voice I was hearing was from victim number five of the story I was covering. There was no answer to my response. Then I thought, I must be losing it. And nothing else happened that afternoon. Later that evening, I was watching some television, and I decided to stay away from the spooky stuff. I had entirely enough of that for one day and I watched some old seasons of Big Brother. Then I turned in for the night, doing my ritual of first my teeth and then my face and moisturizer. I then snuggled into bed with Nilla, my dog. My mind wasn't really thinking about anything except how nice bed was and how good it felt to get horizontal. About 20 minutes of laying in the dark, just on the brink of sleep, I heard what sounded like footsteps on my roof. And I knew it wasn't Santa. I hadn't been that good of a girl this year. Nilla lifted her head and looked up. We heard a few more steps and then nothing. I shrugged it off. Although, had I been thinking about the day's earlier happenings, I probably would have got my gun and flashlight and went and inspected what was going on. But I was warm and comfortable, and soon I drifted off to sleep. I was awoken around 2.30 a.m. by what sounded like a hand clap in my ear, followed by a man's scream. No! What the hell? I figured I was imagining it, and I fell back to sleep without further incident. In the morning, I walked downstairs to find that my kitchen light was on. I, I know for a fact that when I went to sleep the night before, I had turned it off. Unless I sleepwalk and I don't know it, I have no clue why the kitchen light was on. I made some coffee and I sat back down at my laptop. I opened my Word program again and it worked just fine. I started to write a new script and that's when I thought, just for shits and giggles, I wanted to open back up the audio file that I had been working on the day before. So I did. I rewound to where I discussed the fourth victim of the serial killer and I listened intently to myself when I got to the fifth victim. It was just my voice describing events. There was no static, no man's voice, no man screaming. What possibly could have happened the day before? I decided to investigate the home that I have only lived in about nine months now. Out of further curiosity, I did a background search of the house. I had even called my realtor for some research assistance. I truly didn't know much about the house. I do know if someone had died in it, it must be disclosed, but that's only if the prior owner had died in it. I knew for a fact that the last owner before I purchased the house was military, and she was deployed elsewhere and that's why she sold the house. If anyone had died in the home, it it had to be at least several owners ago, right? About an hour later, my realtor had called me back. It seems about 22, 23 years ago, a man who had once lived in this house had lived in the house with his 17-year-old son. He was a single father, 
And this part really makes the hairs on my neck stand up. His son had just come out as gay to his dad. The dad was a huge homophobe. One night, he had woken his son up around 2 or 3 a.m., and he had taken his 17-year-old boy to the roof in the middle of the night. The dad was upset his son was gay. He bound his son's hands with zip ties, and he forced his son up a ladder. The father climbed up the ladder behind him, and he was carrying a rope. The father had devised a noose out of the rope. Securing one end of the rope to the roof, he put his son's head through the noose end, and then he pushed his son from the roof, killing the boy. The date that this murder occurred was the same date that I had recorded that episode that was giving me troubles. The same date I heard the young man's voice and his screams. The boy's body was found by his friends. The boy was hanging from the house when they came to look for him because he had missed several days of school. The father had left a note inside the house. He explained what had happened that night he pushed his son off the roof. He spoke of his embarrassment having a gay son. And a week later, the father's car was pulled from the Rogue River with his remains inside. I still live in this house. Ghosts don't scare me, really. Mostly because I don't believe they intend to do me harm. However, I am curious to see what happens the next anniversary date of the young man's murder by his father. Happy Halloween, friends. Hi, this is Cody, half of Over the Fence True Crime Podcast. And I have a story for you. This is a story I heard when I was very young, and it has haunted me ever since. I found that uh, there are different versions of it everywhere, but this is the story that I was told. There was a young girl, and she was staying home alone at night. And the only comfort that she had was her German Shepherd dog that always stayed by her side. This German Shepherd dog, to bring her comfort whenever she was scared, she would simply just put her hand near her bed or underneath her bed where her dog would lay, and her dog would lick her hand to bring her some sort of reassurance. And one night, Her parents were gone and she was slipping through the television channels. She heard that a crazed killer had escaped from a local insane asylum. Alerts had gone off in the neighborhood. They had alerted everybody to lock all doors and windows. She did that. Even so, she was nervous and she, again, put her hand down, had her trusty dog to lick her hand and make her rest assured that everything was going to be okay. To calm herself, she watches TV until she's ready to go to sleep. And as she's ready to go to sleep, again, she reaches down and lets the dog lick her hand. She turns off the TV, and as she lays her head on her pillow, she hears a sound coming from her bathroom. It's drip, drip, drip. She hadn't heard that sound before because, maybe because she was watching TV. But she decides to ignore it. She's like, I didn't turn the water on. I'm just going to ignore it. Maybe it's just my imagination, or, you know, you're already laying in bed. You don't want to get up anyways. You're like, I'm just going to lay. I'm just going to go to sleep. It's fine. So she puts her hand under her bed. The dog licks her hand. She's like, I'm fine. The dog's not spooked. I shouldn't be spooked. She lays down, and just as she feels like she's going to sleep, she hears the drip, drip, drip. And she's like, okay, I know I didn't leave the water running. I know I didn't leave the water running. She still hasn't worked up the courage to go check out what could possibly be dripping inside of the bathroom. So again, she flips kind of over on her side, reaches under her bed, And sure enough, the dog licks her hand again. She's like, again, the dog's not freaked out. I shouldn't be freaked out. And besides, it's just a leaky faucet. My parents will be home soon. I'm fine. Again, she lays down her head and she hears the continuous dripping. Drip, drip, drip. She was like, I gotta figure out what this sound is. She jumps out of her bed. She runs to the bathroom as fast as she can. And she notices there's no water on the faucet. So she notices that the dripping is coming from her shower so she pulls back the shower curtain as fast as she can and there is her dog hanging from the shower his blood dripping drip 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 she looks back to the mirror that is above the bathroom sink and on it in blood is written maniacs lick hands too and the door shuts behind her Hey spooky friends, it's Aurora from Murder Murder News. I hope you've got some marshmallows and a nice fire because I've got a ghost story for you. A man arrived at his hotel late on a chilly evening. He went to the front desk to check in. The woman at the desk gave him his key and offered to walk him to his room since it had been a slow night. The hotel was old but well maintained. 
It was a bit of a maze and some of the rooms could be difficult to find. Along the walk, they passed a room and heard a loud thud. The door had no number. It appeared to be a regular room for guests and not some utility closet. The woman told him not to worry about the sound, but stay clear of the unmarked door. The man was a little jet lagged from his trip and his curiosity got the better of him. What was behind the unmarked door? He wandered down the hall and found himself in front of the room. He tried the handle. Sure enough, it was locked. He bent down and looked through the wide keyhole. Cold air passed through it. He could feel the chill against his skin. What he saw was a hotel room like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was completely white. She was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door. He stared in confusion for a while. He almost knocked on the door, worried the woman was not okay. He crept down the hall and walked back to his room. The next day, he returned to the door and looked through the keyhole. This time, he just saw red. He couldn't make anything out beside a distinct red color. Perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before and had blocked the keyhole. He decided to consult the woman at the front desk. She sighed and said, did you look through the keyhole? The man told her he had and she said, well, I may as well tell you the story. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room and her ghost haunts it. But these weren't ordinary people. They were so pale, they appeared white all over, except for their eyes, which were red. I hope you enjoyed the story, and I think the moral here is don't be a creep and peek in people's hotel rooms. Don't forget to join Murder Murder News each Friday for historical crime cases told through a victim first lens. My name is Brenda, and I'm the creator and host of Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. And today, I will be telling you all the story of Farmer Peter Stump and how he admitted that he was a murdering werewolf. On Halloween in the year of 1590, a large crowd gathered in the German town of Bedburg to watch a man be executed. The condemned was Peter Stump, who was a 50-year-old farmer who confessed to authorities that he made a pact with Satan. He told the devil that he didn't want to be rich or famous. What he dreamed of was gaining the ability to turn into a werewolf. When the devil granted his request, Peter killed 16 people. Many of these were his own children and allegedly, after killing his eldest son, Peter ate his son's brains. He further claimed that he had sexual relations with his own daughter and a succubus. It is said that Peter's execution was one of the most brutal on record due to his crimes. He was strapped to the torture device called the wheel and was skinned alive as his bones broke. He was decapitated and his body was burned at the stake. His head was then impaled on a post in the center of the village to ensure that no one else would ever consider making a deal with the devil like Peter did. There are very little documents that survive concerning Peter and those that exist are copies of the originals. These documents tell us that Peter was born near a town called Bedburg in the electorate of Cologne in Germany. His exact birth date is unknown due to local church records were destroyed in the Thirty Years' War. It is believed though that he was given the last name as Stump after his left hand was cut off in an accident, but that is not the only tale concerning this. In other stories, when Peter was in wolf form, he had a forepaw cut off. According to these stories, that is what proved Peter was actually a werewolf. Now, Peter was a farmer, and according to officials at the time, Peter committed at least 16 murders, multiple sexual assaults, and incest over a period of 25 years while he was in a form of a wolf. He was further accused of sorcery and living with a she-devil. After Peter was charged, he was interrogated. Now, back in those days, that meant he was tortured. He was stretched on the rack and was severely tortured until he confessed. In this confession, Peter said that he was practicing black magic since the age of 12. He claimed that due to his devotion, the devil gave him a magical belt that enabled him to change into the likeness of a wolf that was, and I quote, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled like fire, a mouth great and wide, with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. 
Now, after he'd take the belt off, Peter would return to his human form. Over 25 years, Peter claimed he ate the flesh of goats, lambs, sheep, men, women, and children. During his time on the rack, he confessed to eating and killing 14 children, two pregnant women and their children in the womb, and his own children. On top of confessing that he was a serial killer and a cannibal, he further confessed that he had sexual relations with a succubus who the devil sent to him as a reward. He lastly confessed that he was in a sexual relationship with his daughter. Now this resulted in her being executed alongside her father. The two of them were executed on Halloween, and to this day, Peter's execution is considered to be one of the most brutal in history. He was tied to a wheel where his flesh was torn from his body in 10 different places. He was then burned before his limbs were broken using the blunt side of an axe to prevent him from rising from his grave. He was then beheaded and his body was fully burned. His daughter was flayed, strangled, and burned alongside her father to ensure that no one would ever consider doing anything like this in the future, local authorities then erected a pole with the torture wheel. They place a figure of a wolf on it, and on top, they place Peter's decapitated head. So the question that you likely all have is, was Peter actually a murderer? Well, we'll never know for sure since many of the details provided in historical documentation are inconsistent with historical record. During the years of Peter's alleged killings, murder and violence were commonplace due to internal wars within the electorate of Cologne. There's also the fact that Peter had converted to be a Protestant and at the time of his death, the area was ruled by Catholics. It isn't inconceivable that the trial of an alleged werewolf was actually a thinly disguised political trial. In addition to this, as a person of disability, Peter would have been considered a burden on society at best, even if he was earning his own living as a farmer. During these times, those with disabilities were outcasts since disability was considered to be a punishment for a person's sins. Consider for a moment that this was Peter's situation due to him losing a hand. As a farmer, life was already challenging even without a disability. Now imagine if you were accused of being a werewolf in league with the devil whose alleged pastime was murdering men, women, and children. So why did people come to the conclusion that Peter must be guilty? Well, when the townspeople started to discover people in their community were dead, local rumors started that it must have been a werewolf that killed them. Remember, my spooky friends, this was back in a day where there were no forensic testing and anything bad that happened was blamed on the devil and his minions. When those in town decided to go hunt for the werewolf that they thought caused the deaths, they tracked what they thought were its footprints. When they thought they were closing in on the creature, there was no wolf. They found Peter walking in the forest instead. So, instead of thinking that it's highly likely that Peter just happened to be walking in the woods at that moment, they presumed that he must have transformed into his human form, and well, he was a werewolf. After hours of torture, he finally confessed. But what if he was actually a serial killer, a rapist, and a cannibal? What if he told the truth about what he did? Where the truth lies in Peter's tale is lost to history, but due to this, he'll be forever known as the murderous, devil-worshipping werewolf. If you want to hear more tales of horrifying history, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Hello, I'm Jackie Moranti, host and creator of Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight. If you've never listened to Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight, I talk about how disease and global crises affect societies, and I talk about these things from an historical and global perspective. I talk about how history seems to repeat and how we can stop it. I do a lot of research on the past, the present, and the future. The story of the Dancing Plague of 1518 is just a small sampling of the stories that you'll hear on Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight. If you haven't listened to my podcast, you should. An unusual event took place in the summer of 1518 in Strasbourg, France. It was the middle of July, and it had been an extremely hot summer. It all began with one woman. The woman came out of her house, and she began to dance. She danced for days without stopping, and before the week was out, more people in the town joined her, then more still. The city councillors were not amused by this craziness. They called in doctors to assess the problem, and the doctors attributed it to overheated blood on the brain. 
The counselors decided that more dancing was just the ticket to shake off the sickness. So they cleared an open-air grain market, commandeered guild halls, and erected a stage next to the horse fair. They escorted the dancers to these locations and let them dance. They hired pipers and drummers so that the dancers could have music, and they hired strong men to hold people upright so they wouldn't collapse. The sun was hot, and it beat down on the grounds of the horse fair and the market, but the dancers kept dancing. They danced through the days and nights without rest or food or water. It's rumored that about 400 people danced themselves to death that summer. And when people started dying, the counselors decided that maybe they were wrong. More dancing was not going to cure anything. So they swung in the opposite direction. They now claimed that the entire town was possessed by demons. They banned dancing in public and the music stopped. The remaining dancers were escorted to a shrine dedicated to St. Vitus, the patron saint of dancers. The dancers' bloody feet were put in red shoes, and they were led around and around a wooden figure of the saint. The dance stopped slowly after a few weeks, and then it stopped altogether. The plague had lifted. Let's talk about the cause of the dancing plague in 1518. Keep in mind that there have been other instances of uncontrollable dancing. Almost all of them have occurred near the River Rhine. Some historians surmise that ergot caused the people of Strasbourg to dance uncontrollably. Ergot is a mold that grows on damp rye. It produces a chemical related to LSD. This chemical causes hallucinations and twitching of the limbs. These hallucinations can be terrifying and the twitching is fairly violent. Ergot poisoning could be what caused the town to dance itself to death. It was probably growing in the rye that they used to make bread. But the people danced uncontrollably for weeks on end without stopping. No food, no water, nothing to sustain them. Much like LSD, ergot would wear off in about 24 hours. It wouldn't remain in people's systems for much longer than that. So maybe it wasn't ergot poisoning. Other historians claim that this was mass hysteria. Some event caused all the townspeople to just go crazy. I guess it could happen, maybe. 400 people just went insane and danced themselves to death. I guess it's possible. The stories from the people who live along the Rhine are a little different. St. Vitus was known to throw curses on people. The people living in the area say that St. Vitus punished the people of Strasbourg for some unknown sin and made them dance until they dropped. Could it be? I'll leave that to you to decide. I want to thank everyone at the Darkcast Network for allowing me to tell my Halloween campfire story. Come join me at Cause of Death, 100 Seconds to Midnight. This is Edward October of October Pod speaking to you out of character while nursing an old-fashioned. This isn't my story to tell. It happened to an old friend, John Iger. He's a part-time writer for October Pod and a full-time pain in the ass. John doesn't believe in God, the devil, or the whole routine. But he does believe in ghosts because he's encountered one. He said it's one of the awfulest things he's ever experienced. We weren't friends at the time this happened, but we knew each other. And I knew everyone else in the story some of them quite well. What I'm about to tell you really happened. This one Halloween, back when we were 13, 14 years old, John got invited to his first party with girls at an age when girls were becoming more and more interesting. There was this one girl named Heidi, on whom John had been crushing all year. I'm not sure Heidi knew John existed, but everybody else knew about his crush. Hell, I even knew about it, and we hadn't even started hanging out yet. John said she dressed up like Cleopatra and was luminous. He had dressed up as Jason Voorhees, a good costume for parties like this because he could always slip off the hockey mask if any kissing needed to be done. The guys who dressed up in zombie or werewolf makeup were not so lucky. The party was being thrown by this kid a grade or two above us who lived with her dad in this old farmhouse. Her dad was a deer hunter, so there was taxidermy hanging from the walls in just about every wood-paneled room. I'd been there once or twice myself and can confirm it was, um, it was creepy. 
Anyway, her dad worked the third and would be gone all night. And as you might have guessed, kids started playing truth or dare and spin the bottle. At some point, John went in the kitchen for a slice of pizza and a couple of the other girls in there came up to him and said that Heidi wanted to play Seven Minutes in Heaven with him. Now, if you've never played it, Seven Minutes in Heaven is a game where you and someone of the opposite sex are put in a dark closet for seven minutes with the assumption that you'd be making out with one another. No questions asked for the whole time you're in there. John suspected he might be falling for a prank, but his love for Heidi was just too strong. They led him to a walk-in closet overstuffed with winter coats, told him that Heidi was waiting for him in there, and shoved him in. There was no way to lock the closet from the outside, so someone sat against the door and blocked it with their weight. John said it was pitch black in there and smelled like dust and mothballs. He whispered Heidi's name, and then he felt her arms around him and her hair falling on the back of his neck. I'm here, she whispered in his ear, and he said his whole body broke out in goose flesh. John felt her hands all over him, squeezing him good and tight, sometimes painfully. She kept breathing, you know, like panting in his ear. It was weird, but at the same time, John said he loved it. Now, I'm going to pause it here to say that I think a lot more happened in that closet than John lets on, but this is all he's comfortable discussing. Well, anyway, after the seven minutes was up, someone flung the closet door open wide, flooding it with light. John saw that everybody at the party was huddled around the door laughing at him with these big stupid grins on their faces. And to his shock, he saw that one of the kids outside the door was Heidi, but if Heidi had been out there the whole time, then who the hell was in the closet with John? They just laughed harder and told John that no one was in there with him. It was a gag, and that was the whole point of it. John turned on the closet light and searched around, nothing but coats and shoes. He said his face must have turned pale because someone finally asked him what had happened. He told them. They could tell by his expression that he wasn't putting them on. No one was laughing now. According to John and a few other people who were there that I've spoken to, Heidi started sobbing uncontrollably. She cried so hard that she made herself puke and spent the rest of the night in the bathroom. At October Pod, we tell true, true-ish, and classic tales of horror and the paranormal with a retro vintage aesthetic. Find all of our links at octoberpodvhs.com. Dot com. October Pod, retro horror for bold individualists. Hi, this is Molly from Over the Fence True Crime Podcast, and I'm here to tell you a spooky story. One that always made me feel a little frightened to babysit when I was a young girl. So here's how the story goes. There was a teenage girl one night who was watching television while babysitting. She had put the young kids to bed and she was just enjoying herself, you know, plenty of snacks in the house plenty of TV to watch. And as she's sitting there, the phone rings. So she answers the phone and someone on the other line just cackles. <laughs> she kind of like, oh, who's this? Her friends knew she was babysitting that night. So she thought maybe it's my friends playing a joke on me. So she hangs up, goes back to watching her TV. Phone rings again. She picks it up and a spooky voice says, go check on the children. And she doesn't really understand what they're talking about. She kind of ignores it and again, hangs up. She's like, I don't know. This is someone playing a prank on me. This is not funny. Again, the phone rings. Go check on the children. It whispers. So now she's kind of getting a little scared. She picks up the phone, hangs up, picks up the phone, calls her friends. Are you guys playing a joke on me? Her friends don't know what she's talking about. It's not us. We're not doing anything. She hangs up the phone and tries to distract herself, changes the channel, puts something funny on TV. Phone rings again. You need to go check on the children. She again hangs up. Now she's scared. She's really scared. She decides to call the police because she doesn't know what else to do at this point. She calls the police and tells them, hey, there's someone calling my house. They're playing a joke on me. They're playing pranks. I really don't like it. And the police say, okay, you know what? We can trace the phone call. We'll see what's going on. Give us a few minutes. We'll give you a call back. She hangs up the phone. The phone rings again. I told you, you need to go check on the children. She's really freaked out at this point. She hangs up the phone. 
She doesn't know what to do. So she's, you know, pacing downstairs and she knows the kids are sleeping okay upstairs. She isn't, she's not afraid that anything is wrong. No one's been in the house. So after that last phone call from the stranger, the police give her a call back and she answers the phone and they tell her, you need to leave the house immediately. So she drops the phone, she exits the house and luckily the police are there super quickly to meet her. And they tell her as she gets outside that the calls were coming from inside the house she was babysitting in. The police enter the house, they walk upstairs, and they find both the children dead. Hello, I'm Charles, one of the co-hosts of California True Crime. We hope you enjoy our story on the Fresno Nightcrawler. Happy Halloween! The amazing drama you're about to hear is a matter of human record. You may believe it or not, but the people who lived this story, they believed it. They know. They took that one step beyond. Imagine, if you will, a man, alone in his home, nestled in a quiet Fresno, California suburb. Each night he closes his curtains, checks the windows, rechecks the locks on every door, brings his brindle mastiff in from the cold. He would check the slightly used security cameras that he had installed to watch his yard, and each night the cameras would record nothing. Nothing would appear on the tape. This November evening in 2007, he crawled into bed, his faithful dog next to him. The time ticked by. In the early morning hours, the dog raised her head. Her neck muscles tightened, her eyes focused on the window that led to the front yard. At first, she wouldn't move, staring at the curtain as though she could see through it, listening. All at once, she jumped from the bed, standing between him and the curtain, her low growl growling more, more terrifying until finally breaking out into a deep bark, protecting him from some unseen visitor that had descended on the small house in Central California. He sat, paralyzed in bed, waiting, struggling to hear what his dog had heard. Nothing. He finally musters the courage. He crosses his home to his office where the TV sat, sharing live video from the front yard. The small silver TV, warm from running through each night, showed nothing between the lines of static, just his empty front yard in black and white. He shut down the recording, pressed the rewind button and waited. Then he watched and re-watched the night's footage. Trees swaying in the wind, a car raced by, everything else was still. But he knew there was something there, something he just couldn't see. During the next day, he was restless, tired. Everyone that he talked to thought he was imagining things. After all, he couldn't even describe what was torturing him the night before. He spent the day preparing. Tonight, things would change. Tonight, he had to prove to everyone that something was visiting him. He had to prove to himself. He moved the cameras delicately in the yard, checked his television and ready to make shift bed in his office chair so that he could watch every second as it unfolded. His faithful dog laying at his feet. The hours went slowly. He forced his eyes to stay open even though he felt more and more groggy. The static on the black and white TV was at first hard to watch, but after several hours began to lull him, calling him to rest. His head drifted towards his chest and his breath deepened. Maybe a few seconds of rest would be okay. Then all at once, his dog was on her feet, barking relentlessly. He rushed to the window, but there his yard sat empty, the light from the lamppost turning his green grass a sickly yellow. His stomach fell. How could there be nothing there? He moved back to his temporary resting place in front of the television. But this time, when he looked at the screen, his eyes widened and his breath lost. Between the thick, static lines moving up and down in the recording, there was something, something in the middle of his yard. He stared at the screen, not even daring to blink, his mind struggling to understand what he was seeing. It was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It was alive, moving, but unlike any creature. Was that the word? Yes, creature he had ever encountered. He looked quickly to make sure he was recording. He was. On the screen, the creature was white and only a few feet tall. The top of the creature was roundish. It had two skinny legs and no discernible arms. It stood in the yard still, and then it would move. It moved oddly, 
almost as if a weightless, somehow buoyed by its head, defying all gravity. His mind whirled. He'd been right. Something had been in his yard, something no one had ever seen before. But how? How did it get into the yard? He could see on the screen that the gate surrounding his home was shut, locked with a padlock. It was an iron gate with a sharp top. It couldn't have crawled over. Then the creature appeared to walk, its unusually long legs slowly lumbering ever closer to his front door, each step silent. Its legs didn't even appear to touch the ground as it moved awkwardly. It stopped, standing on the concrete walkway just a few feet away from where he sat inside his house. He never took his eyes off the screen. One, he waited. Two, he waited. Three, he waited. It stood there for 19 seconds. Without warning, the creature resumed walking. Within seconds, it was outside the area of the cameras. He ran to the window and opened the curtains. What was outside had caused him to freeze in place. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. The creature had left and there was no sign it had ever been there. His mastiff had laid down and drifted off to sleep, but he couldn't shut his mind off. Adrenaline rushed through his body. He watched and re-watched the footage, desperately trying to discern what the creature could be. It didn't look like an animal, more like a pair of pants, disembodied walking through his yard. But what did it want? Why his yard? Would it be back? There was more questions than answers. Each time he watched the video, he grew sicker. This creature had been in his yard many times. He knew it. He knew it would be back. He felt tethered to this unknown creature in a way he couldn't describe. The next day, he showed his video to family and friends, then to the news stations. The creature in his yard was given the name the Fresno Nightcrawler. Some people believed him, others thought it a hoax. He learned that no one else had seen what he'd seen, and no one could answer his questions. He only knew he had to see it again. Now, his nights weren't spent trying to sleep. Each night, he huddled into his office, watching the small TV connected to his security cameras. It would come back. It had to. And he would capture it again. And he would finally know what it wanted. You may not believe, but the people who experienced it do. And now, they take that one step beyond and wait for another chance to experience the unknown. Hola and bienvenidos. My name is Jasmine Castillo, and I am the podcaster of Hands Off My Podcast. I bring awareness to missing and murdered indigenous persons, LGBTQ, two spirits, black indigenous people of color, as well as Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities. They have the stories of their loved ones murdered, missing, exploited, human trafficked. Yet this evening, I'm going to do things differently. Knowing that this is the month of October and all things spooky and all things that go bump in the night. And even though Hollow's Eve is once every year, you could see my household, we celebrated 364 additional days. And throughout my life, I've always been called many things, not just my own name. I've been called crazy, psychotic, or even just straight up insane. There is a little bit of truth to that because I know that I come from a long line of mentally disturbed individuals, but no one has ever pointed out that whatever I had, these outlandish tales, that I would be considered clairvoyant or prophetic. I've had many dreams since I was a child. One of the ones that completely stuck with me to this day, like tree sap seeping between woven lace. It felt like this was another lifetime or just an inkling of what was to come. I had a grandmother who I'd called Gram Gram. She lived off of 29th and Hour Street, a not so pleasant side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You can call it economically challenging for a brown girl. I recall the many days on weekends where I would skip down the street to the nearest corner store on the quest to pick up my favorite goodies. I enjoyed playing with my two cousins when they finally moved in with Gram Gram, they both lived on the top floor of this old, dilapidated house. I've had so many dreams about this house. This house holds onto pain, anguish, and suffering. 
This house was my own house of horror as a child. There was always something eerie about the second floor of this house, not including the steps just to get to the top landing. My two cousins were so close, we protected each other. We were infatuated with Gloria Estefan and pretended to be our own singing group or our sisterhood called the Wild Girls with a Z. Becoming someone else when we hid in the basement away from all the fears and the abuse and the pain that brought us together. As the years went by, we grew distant and went our separate ways living our lives and becoming mothers of our own. And this is when my delusional dreams began. I always had my dreams go back to that house, my childhood house of horror. Even though I was safe in my own bed many, many miles away, I would close my eyes and actually see myself leaving the front of this house, walking down the stairs to the front, turning around to veer my view of the top floor windows. It felt so strange because I've never left the house at dark. As a child of the 70s, we were always told, once the street lights went on, you best be home. But this night, I ventured out into the cold, misty sidewalk, staring at the house, worrying about why am I on the street so late? I could have walked to the corner store blindfolded on my many times that I ventured to gather my rewards at the end of the block. But this time, I walked past that store, not even looking to the left of me to take a glimpse to see if anyone was there at this late of hour. The streets were mist that draped over me like a funeral veil, and your bones hurt with chilliness in the air. I told myself, why did I put on something much warmer? But I always came back to the same question. Why am I even out here? I don't know how and why I was attracted to the end of the street, but I kept walking and walking. It was as if something was drawing me to keep me walking towards the darkness. I can hear a faint noise coming from the end of the block. It sounded like animals screaming, but I couldn't see through the mist. I kept squinting my eyes to get a better look to what the noise was coming from, but all I saw was darkness. My feet carried me to the end of that block, and I would have kept going if it hadn't been me slamming into a cold, metallic object that blocked my way. I grasped my childlike hands around these bars, touching the sleek, black metal. As I looked up to discover that these long black bars reached across my face like thin black roots pressed against my cheek. The noise was coming from the other side of this gate. It was as if there was a twirling of sand like an hourglass that was broken on its side as a wicked wind whips past and takes its hostage. As I peered through the slits of this black gate, I saw what would be almost like seeing an apocalypse at the end of times. This was so much suffering. I couldn't move my head to take my eyes off such horror and sadness. Children, animals were emaciated, walking lifeless souls with sunken eyes, sighing their last breath of life. There was a radiating heat coming from within this gated area. This is something you will never forget. And to this day, I've always wondered if I was looking through the gates of hell or looking within my mind, my own hell. Hello, this is Kona, host of And Then They Were Gone. The story I have for you is The Boarded Window by Ambrose Bierce. The Boarded Window was first published in the San Francisco Examiner on April 12th, 1891. According to the website A Passion for Horror, Ambrose Bierce was a journalist, satirist, and prolific writer of short stories. And interestingly, he disappeared in Mexico in 1913. And although there's been much speculation about what happened to him, nobody has ever learned the truth. In 1830, only a few miles away from what is now the great city of Cincinnati, lay an immense and almost unbroken forest. The whole region was sparsely settled by people of the frontier, restless souls who no sooner had hewn fairly habitable homes out of the wilderness and attained to that degree of prosperity which day to day we should all call indigence, 
Then impelled by some mysterious impulse of their nature, they abandoned all and pushed farther westward to encounter new perils and privations in the effort to regain the meager comforts which they had voluntarily renounced. Many of them had already forsaken that region for the remoter settlements, but among those remaining was one who had been of the first arriving. He lived alone in a house of logs, surrounded on all sides by the great forest, of whose gloom and silence he seemed a part, for no one had ever known him to smile nor speak a needless word. His simple wants were supplied by the sale or barter of skins of wild animals in the river town, for not a thing did he grow upon the land which, if needful, he might have claimed by right of undisturbed possession. There were evidences of improvement. A few acres of ground immediately about the house had once been cleared of its trees, the decayed stumps of which were half concealed by the new growth that had been suffered to repair the ravage wrought by the axe. Apparently, the man's zeal for agriculture had burned with the falling flame, expiring in penitential ashes. The little log house with its chimney of sticks, its roof of warping clapboards, weighted with traversing poles and its chinking of clay, had a single door and directly opposite, a window. The latter, however, was boarded up. Nobody could remember a time when it was not, and none knew why it was so closed. Certainly not because of the occupant's dislike of light and air, for on those rare occasions when a hunter had passed that lonely spot, the recluse had commonly been seen sunning himself on his doorstep if heaven had provided sunshine for his need. I fancy there are few persons living today who ever knew the secret of that window, but I am one, as you shall see. The man's name was said to be Murloc. He was apparently 70 years old, actually about 50. Something besides years had had a hand in his aging. His hair and long, full beard were white, his gray, lusterless eyes sunken, his face singularly seamed with wrinkles which appeared to belong to two intersecting systems. In figure, he was tall and spare, with a stoop of the shoulders, a burden bearer. I never saw him. These particulars I learned from my grandfather, from whom I also got the man's story when I was a lad. He had known him when living nearby in that early day. One day, Murloc was found in his cabin dead. It was not a time and place for coroners and newspapers, and I suppose it was agreed that he had died from natural causes, or I should have been told and should remember. I know only that with what was probably a sense of the fitness of things, the body was buried near the cabin, alongside the grave of his wife, who had preceded him by so many years that local tradition had retained hardly a hint of her existence. That closes the final chapter of this true story, excepting, indeed, the circumstance that many years afterward, in company with an equally intrepid spirit, I penetrated to the place and ventured near enough to the ruined cabin to throw a stone against it, and ran away to avoid the ghost which every well-informed boy thereabout knew haunted the spot. But there is an earlier chapter, that supplied by my grandfather. When Murloc built his cabin and began laying sturdily about with his axe to hew out a farm, the rifle, meanwhile, his means of support, he was young, strong, and full of hope. In that eastern country, whence he came, he had married, as was the fashion, a young woman in all ways worthy of his honest devotion, who shared the dangers and privations of his lot with a willing spirit and a light heart. There is no known record of her name. Of her charms of mind and person, tradition is silent, and the doubter is at liberty to entertain his doubt. But God forbid that I should share it. Of their affectionate happiness, there is abundant assurance in every added day of the man's widowed life. For what but the magnetism of a blessed memory could have chained that venturesome spirit to a lot like that? One day, Murloc returned from gunning in a distant part of the forest to find his wife prostrate with fever and delirious. There was no physician within miles, no neighbor, nor was she in a condition to be left to summon help. So he set about the task of nursing her back to health. But at the very end of the third day, she fell into unconsciousness and passed away, apparently with never a gleam of returning reason. From what we know of a nature like this, we may venture to sketch in some of the details of the outline picture drawn by my grandfather. When convinced that she was dead, Murloc had sense enough to remember that the dead must be prepared for burial. In performance of the sacred duty, he blundered now and again, did certain things incorrectly, and others which he did correctly were done over and over. 
His occasional failures to accomplish some simple and ordinary act filled him with astonishment, like that of a drunken man who wanders at the suspension of familiar natural laws. He was surprised too that he did not weep, surprised and a little ashamed. Surely it is unkind not to weep for the dead. Tomorrow, he said aloud, I shall have to make the coffin and dig the grave, and then I shall miss her when she is no longer in sight. But now she is dead, of course, but it is all right. It must be all right somehow. Things cannot be so bad as they seem. He stood over the body in the fading light, adjusting the hair and putting the finishing touches to the simple toilet, doing all mechanically with soulless care. And still through his consciousness ran an undersense of conviction that all was right, that he should have her again as before and everything explained. He had no experience in grief. His capacity had not been enlarged by use. His heart could not contain it all, nor his imagination rightly conceive it. He did not know he was so hard struck that knowledge would come later and never go. Grief is an artist of powers as various as the instruments upon which he plays his dirges for the dead, evoking from some the sharpest, shrillest notes from others the low, grave chords that throb, recurrent like the slow beating of a distant drum. Some natures it startles, some it stupefies. To one, it comes like the stroke of an arrow stinging all the sensibilities to a keener life. To another, as the blow of a bludgeon, which in crushing benumbs. We may conceive Murloc to have been that way affected for, and here we are upon surer ground than that of conjecture, no sooner had he finished his pious work then, sinking into a chair by the side of the table which the body lay, and noting how white the profile showed in the deepening gloom, he laid his arms upon the table's edge and dropped his face into them, tearless yet and untenorably weary. At that moment came in through the open window a long, wailing sound like the cry of a lost child in the far deeps of the darkening wood. But the man did not move. Again, and nearer than before, sounded that unearthly cry upon his failing sense. Perhaps a wild beast. Perhaps it was a dream. For Murloc was asleep. Some hours later, as it afterward appeared, this unfaithful watcher awoke, and lifting his head from his arms, intently listened. He knew not why. There, in the black darkness by the side of the dead, recalling all without a shock, he strained his eyes to see he knew not what. His senses were all alert. His breath was suspended. His blood has stilled its tides as if to assist the silence. Who, what, had wakened him, and where was it? Suddenly, the table shook beneath his arms, and at the same moment, he heard, or fancied that he heard, a light, soft step, another sounds as of bare feet upon the floor. He was terrified beyond the power to cry out or move. Perforce he waited, waited there in the darkness, through seeming centuries of dread as one may know, yet live to tell. He tried vainly to speak the dead woman's name, vainly to stretch forth his hand across the table to learn if she were there. His throat was powerless. His arms and hands were like lead. Then occurred something most frightful. Some heavy body seemed hurled against the table with an impetus that pushed it against his breast so sharply as nearly to overthrow him. And at the same instant, he heard and felt the fall of something upon the floor with so violent a thump that the whole house was shaken by the impact. A scuffling ensued and a confusion of sounds impossible to describe. Murloc had risen to his feet. Fear had by excess forfeited control of his faculties. He flung his hands upon the table. Nothing was there. There is a point at which terror may turn to madness, and madness incites to action. With no definite intent from no motive but the wayward impulse of a madman, Murloc sprang to the wall with a little groping, seized his loaded rifle, and without aim, discharged it. By the flash which lit up the room with a vivid illumination, he saw an enormous panther dragging the dead woman toward the window, its teeth fixed in her throat. Then there were darkness blacker than before and silence. 
and when he returned to consciousness, the sun was high and the wood vocal with songs of birds. The body lay near the window where the beast had left it when frightened away by the flash and report of the rifle. The clothing was deranged, the long hair in disorder, the limbs lay anyhow. From the throat, dreadfully lacerated, had issued a pool of blood not yet entirely coagulated. The ribbon with which he had bound the wrists was broken. The hands were tightly clenched. Between the teeth was a fragment of the animal's ear. Hi there, I'm tour guide Jen of Nopeville. Normally I'm joined by my best friend, tour guide Christine, as we lead our wonderful tours through the dark and sinister streets of our beloved city. We provide tours featuring cryptids, true crime, hauntings, and all the things that make you say nope. We guarantee you'll find a tour to suit your tastes over here in Nopeville, so come visit us sometime. It was supposed to be a joke, a silly thing I told a gullible friend just to see how he would respond to it, but recently, I've begun to wonder if the joke's on me. If that's true, then I was wrong about the significance of 1.27 a.m. Oh, so very wrong. A good friend of mine was going through a tough time and struggling with the identity crisis we all seem to suffer through in our early 20s. He was reaching the end of his college career and fed up with the path he had shepherded into choosing for himself. We would talk for hours about how much of the best years of our lives that college sucks up only to leave you feeling afraid that you've made all the wrong choices and now you're stuck. One particularly rough night, in an effort to make him look forward to something, I told him that when 1.27 a.m. rolled around, he needed to enjoy himself. He questioned the significance of that particular time and I told him not to worry about it and just do it. He reluctantly agreed and when the time rolled around and passed, I asked him if he did as I instructed. He simply stated that he forgot, so I playfully admonished him for letting such a magical hour pass him by without notice. This idea was literally just a random time selection that wasn't too far in the future while we were talking and had no actual significance. At least, that's what I thought. Even as I write this, 1.27 AM is creeping closer yet again, and I feel my stomach nodding up in fear. You see. I have discovered in the days since I made up this special time that there really is significance to it, but it's not a magical time, as I told my friend. No, it holds a much more sinister meaning for me now. Nearly ten minutes away now, and the room already grows colder. Pet owners, have you ever seen your cat or dog just stare very intently at something in the room, but when you look where they're looking, you see absolutely nothing? Yeah, me too but I've always wondered if it's really nothing that they're staring at. I can tell you now that they really are looking at something. The night after I made up the mystical hour for my friend, I noticed my cat suddenly look up at the ceiling in the corner of my room. I, of course, looked up there too and saw nothing. So I looked back at my cat and to my surprise, she wasn't looking at me like she normally does when this happens. She was still looking there in the corner, but slowly she tracked her gaze across the ceiling and out the window as if following the progress of something moving through the room. I never saw anything where she was looking, but this creeped me out, so I grabbed my phone to text someone about it and happened to notice that it was 1.27 AM exactly. Since I still believed it was a meaningless time, I simply smiled a bit at the silly joke and proceeded to text a fellow cat owner about what I had just witnessed. He wrote back that my house must be haunted, but whether he really believed that or not is still unknown to me. Staring seemingly at nothing is not a new occurrence with my cat, but this was the first time that I could not get her attention and that she tracked something's movements in the room, rather than just looking back at me after a moment. This particular occurrence rattled me deeply and gave me a very bad feeling. This happened only a week ago, and since then my cat has had her attention caught by something in my room that isn't me every single night. I check the time on my phone every single time I notice her doing this, and the time is always the same. 1.27 a.m. The spot she's looking at changes every night, but the process is always the same. She notices something, stares in that one spot for some time, then she tracks movement across the room to either the window or the door. While this is happening, it's always as if I don't even exist anymore because there's no breaking that eye contact for her. My cat never makes a move on whatever she sees. In fact, she always appears to just freeze completely. It's almost as if whatever she sees is something she does not want to notice her. Like, some kind of predator. Less than five minutes away now. I mentioned before that the room was growing colder. 
Still, it continues to do so. In the last few days, I've noticed this temperature change and initially thought nothing of it because the weather is still nice enough to leave windows open and getting cooler in the evenings. However, I've realized that the change is gradual all the way up until 127, and then once my cat has watched this thing leave my room, the temperature steadily goes back to normal. I'm afraid of whatever it is that my cat sees in my room because she seems to show a measure of fear when she spots it, and I've heard that spirits can make a room's temperature plummet with their presence. I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that whatever my cat is seeing is truly a spirit, but it is something that is manipulating the temperature of my room that I can't see with my own eyes. I've learned from various movies and shows that the presence of a demon or a truly evil spirit will actually cause an increase in temperature. I've also been led to believe that most spirits are unable to harm the living. This knowledge, of course, has to be taken with a grain of salt because of their sources, but these ideas don't quite match up with the experiences I've been having. If what my cat sees truly is a spirit, which the cooling temperature lends one to believe, then it should not be able to harm me or my cat. If this is true, then why would my cat perceive this to be a threat? And why is my body responding as though I'm anticipating the arrival of something malevolent? Less than a minute now, and I'm beginning to shiver under my blanket. The fear and dread are all very real now, and I have no idea why I'm so much more fearful tonight than I have been on previous nights. My dread has been growing steadily as the days pass, but tonight it's almost unbearable. My breath comes out in a cloud. It's never been this cold before tonight. Oh, God. Only five seconds remain. Four. Three. Two. One. The time is now 1.27 a.m. and my cat raises her head and looks directly at me. No. My breath catches. She's looking just past me. Behind me. This is Nydia from The Crime Diner. For your bedtime story, I thought I'd tell you about the scariest things to happen while you're sleeping. That would be not waking up. In 1975, the Vietnam War ended and Laos became a communist country. The new leadership there viewed the Hmong as traitors for their work with the United States. Many survivors from the war fled their homes after the war to become refugees in the U.S. The families that fled communist Laos had to resettle in an unknown country with all the uncertainties and ghosts of their past wartime trauma. Hmong refugees in the U.S. suffered from high rates of poverty and soon, a mysterious ailment seemed to befall the men. Many of the afflicted were teenagers and young men under the age of 50. In the early 70s through early 80s, these young male refugees were seemingly dying during their sleep. They died while sleeping one by one, thousands of miles from home. 116 of the 117 were healthy men. 47-year-old Young Leng Tao died in his sleep with his wife beside him. He died with tears in his eyes. Whatever he was experiencing was terrifying the man to death. He was the fourth Hmong man to die while sleeping in nine months. He was the 13th nocturnal Hmong death recorded since 1978. Victims experienced the strange feeling of feeling awake. While they have a realistic perception of their environment, they can't move. Worse, they feel an overwhelming fear and dread accompanied by chest pressure and difficulty breathing. Something was killing the Hmong men in their sleep, and no one could figure out what it was. Investigators could find no medical explanation for the deaths, but many community members theorized that the deaths were from exposure to chemical nerve agents that refugee soldiers would have been exposed to. That theory was not supported by doctors. The nerve gas was ruled out because the men were only dying during the night. Some of the Hmong believed they were being punished by the spirits of their ancestors for leaving their homeland. The men that died were all in good health and had no apparent heart condition. It was reported by witnesses that the men seemed to have been experiencing some sort of nightmare or sleep paralysis. To family members, it appeared their loved ones were dying from a terrifying nightmare. Medical investigators later classified the fatal ailment as Sudden Unexplained Nocturnal Death Syndrome, or SUNS. The wave of SUNS death among the Hmong is still unexplained. Hello everybody, this is your friend Steph from Sinister Story Hour, and if you're like me, Spooky season is your favorite time of year. As a fan of all things creepy, I thought today I would talk to you about one of the creepiest urban legends that I've heard, 
I love urban legends, and I hope you do too. The Dybbuk box first entered pop culture in 2003, and although I'd heard of it before, I didn't actually realize that it was a real thing. Some people believe that the Dybbuk box is the most haunted item in the world, and if you're like me, you're thinking, what exactly is a Dybbuk box? It's actually just a small box or cabinet that's meant to hold wine, but it isn't like any other box. It's actually said to be haunted by a Dybbuk, which stems from Jewish folklore. A Dybbuk is a spirit that can haunt and possess the living, and is considered mostly to be malicious. It's believed also that it's the dislocated soul of a dead person. The concept of the Dybbuk box has been around since as early as the 16th or 17th century. What I learned by researching this story is that exorcisms are not just practiced by the Catholic religion. And I guess I kind of just took it for granted that that was mostly who practices them. But actually a rabbi named Isaac Loria was considered the father of Jewish mysticism. And he did a lot of spiritual work. He believed in ghosts, demons, and lost souls, and he did perform exorcisms. Our story today, though, starts in 2003 with a man named Kevin Manis who purchases the box from a local attorney in Portland, Oregon during a yard sale. He goes to this yard sale, it was actually an estate sale, and Kevin Manis was a creative writer, so you definitely want to keep that in the back of your mind as we continue through this story because I'm going to bring it up later. Kevin was at the estate sale looking for things to sell in his furniture restoration store. The estate sale was for a woman named Havella, who had been a Holocaust survivor and she had recently passed away. So Kevin goes and pays for his things and afterwards Havella's granddaughter tells him that she noticed that he had purchased the Dybbuk box and Kevin doesn't actually know what item she's referring to. So a little bit about Havella's background, she had actually escaped Poland when it was occupied by Nazis but she was basically the only one. She lost her parents, brother, sister, husband, two sons, and a daughter. Which is horrifying, that's so much loss. She fled from Poland and lived in Spain until the end of the war. She came to the US with three items. The wine cabinet happened to be one of them. Havella lived to be 103 and she wished that the box would be buried with her. But according to the rules of Orthodox Judaism, they're not allowed to be buried with items. And her granddaughter, although a skeptic, knew enough about the box to know that she didn't have a good feeling about it. The granddaughter passes on to Kevin that her grandmother had adamantly demanded that nobody ever open the box no matter what the reason. Kevin offered at that point to let her keep the box and she said there was no way that she wanted that thing that he had purchased it, now he had to take it. She began to cry and actually asked him to leave, and he just assumed that maybe it was the emotion from the loss of her grandma. So Kevin Manis takes the box back to his shop, and he leaves it with the salesperson there while he goes to run some errands. And it takes less than an hour for the problems to start. The salesperson calls in a panic, saying there's someone in the shop breaking glass. All of the exits and security gates get locked, and Kevin tells her to call the police, but his phone battery died all of a sudden, for no reason. And he rushes back to the shop, he finds the salesperson just on the floor in the corner, sobbing uncontrollably. And he heads to the basement, and as he reaches the area, he smells this overpowering scent of cat urine, and the lights won't turn on. He looks around and all of the light bulbs in the basement have been shattered. The salesperson quit that day, never speaking of the experience ever again. So despite all of that, Kevin decides that he's going to restore the box to give to his mother as a birthday gift. Just before he gives it away, he decides to open the box, which he's already been told not to do. Inside there was a mechanism and once you opened one of the doors, the other door and a small drawer underneath would all open as well. He finds two pennies inside that were wheat pennies from 1925 and 1928. There were also two locks of hair, both bound with rope, one brown and one blonde. That alone would have done me in if we're being honest. Finding rope binding locks of hair seems a bit creepy. There's also a dried rosebud a four-legged candlestick, a golden wine cup, and a granite sculpture that was carved with the words Shalom. He didn't realize it at the time, 
Those are all items that are said to fight demons in Jewish folklore. On October 28, 2001, Kevin gifted the box to his mother. He gave it to his mother at the shop and then he had to go take a call. He described it as being less than five minutes until an employee came running into his office yelling that there was something wrong with his mom. He rushed to his mother and finds her sitting in a chair completely expressionless with tears running down her cheeks. Later, she described a cool breeze coming from the box as she had opened it. She ended up suffering a stroke, and although she did recover later, she temporarily lost her ability to speak. The day after the stroke, Kevin asked her how she was feeling. She got tears in her eyes, and she spelled out the letters on a piece of paper, no gift, N-O-G-I-F-T. He thinks maybe she just can't remember it, so he tells her, yes, I did give you a birthday gift. And she gets even more upset and writes the letters H-A-T-E-G-I-F-T, hate gift. He laughed it off and he tells her he's sorry for her not loving the box, but if she just gets better, he would buy her anything that she wanted. The box actually ended up staying in that family for two years, and in the time that it was in the family, there were many other family members that had different activities that they recorded related to the box. At one point, Kevin and his siblings compare stories about the things that they've experienced, and they all realize that they've had the exact same dream of an old woman appearing as a shadow that has sunken eyes. They finally took the box back to the shop, where the brother of one of the employees accidentally knocked the box off of a shelf. Shortly after that, he committed suicide. A couple years later, the employee as well, himself, committed suicide. Kevin then tried to give the box to his girlfriend. I love how this guy keeps trying to give it to his loved ones. Like, here, I love you so much, just take this haunted box that's making my life a living hell. That only lasted for two days, when the girlfriend asked Kevin to please try to sell the box. He ended up selling it that day to a middle-aged couple, and a few days later, he finds the box by the entrance of his shop with a note that reads, quote, this has a bad darkness, end quote. He took the box back to his own house, again, and at that point, he begins to see shadow figures. Finally, in 2003, he put the box for sale on eBay. The eBay listing described the box as having belonged to a Holocaust survivor and some details of what he has personally experienced. The listing is extremely long, but there is an excerpt of it that I thought was pretty terrifying. Now this is a direct quote from the eBay listing, quote, I would destroy this thing in a second, except I really don't have any understanding of what I may or may not be dealing with. I'm afraid, and I do mean afraid, that if I destroy the cabinet, whatever it is that seems to have come with the cabinet may just stay here with me. I've been told that there are people who shop on eBay that understand these kinds of things and specifically look for these kinds of items. If you are one of these people, please, please buy this cabinet and do whatever you do with a thing like this. Help me." End quote. So Missouri college student Losef or Joseph Niedzki purchased the box from eBay for $140. He immediately experienced hair loss, which the guy was in his early 20s, so that was different. He could also smell some really strange offensive smells, and then all of a sudden he would smell sometimes the scent of jasmine. A man named Jason Haxton became obsessed with the box, and he ends up purchasing it from Joseph for $200. He describes some pretty creepy circumstances as well, immediately upon touching the box. He describes it as the box feeling like it had collapsed into a liquid in his hands, and he felt a piercing feeling in his stomach. He said he felt paralyzed with pain, and he had nightmares of a woman that came with the box. His wife also experienced those things. Haxton eventually wrote a book about the box. In 2012, Kevin Manis and Jason Haxton helped to consult for the film Possession, which is actually a movie that's about this same box. Nowadays, you can actually find the Dybbuk box in care of Zach Bagans himself and his crew at the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas. It has not been a move without incident, however, as there have been some reports of activities since it's been in his possession. Not long after it arrived in the museum, 
Some mysterious protruding holes started to appear in the walls around the box, almost looking like something wanted to break out of the wall. Bagans himself, along with staff and visitors, have witnessed black shadows, fainting, feeling ill, irrational emotions that can't be explained, such as anger, anxiety, and other things. Also, some people believe that Post Malone himself was one of the people affected by the Dybbuk box. Post Malone was on an episode of Ghost Hunters Quarantine in 2020, where he was touching Zack's shoulder as Zack opened the box. Subsequently, Post Malone's private plane experienced some problems, as two tires blew out while it was in the air. That incident has been linked to multiple safety violations that were also linked to that plane, and they were able to land safely, but Post Malone was also involved in a car accident and his home was broken into. Other things associated with the box are horrible nightmares, odd and offensive smells, hives, and welts. Some believe that all of the evil of the 20th century is being held in these boxes, and that's why they're so evil. According to some sources, there's only one Dybbuk box, but there were others that claim there are as many as 10 Dybbuk boxes that exist in the world. And Zach Bagans actually owns two. A total of eight of the boxes have been located and are accounted for, but there are two still out there with their whereabouts unknown. Many believe that the story of the Dybbuk box is all a hoax. Now, if you remember, Kevin Manis was a creative writer. There's a Facebook post from Manis in 2015 where Kevin basically admits to having conjured up the entire legend. Now, Manis and Haxton basically both claim to be experts in the field, all the while vying for attention. There's no argument that they've both profited greatly from this item and the concept of the Dybbuk box. So friends, tell me what you think. Is it the most haunted object of the world or a simple hoax? Either way, it does make for an entertaining story and I hope that's exactly what this did entertain you. I wish you all the spookiest yet safest season ever and happy Halloween. Hi there, I'm tour guide Christine of Nopeville. Normally I'm joined by my best friend tour guide Jen as we lead our wonderful tourists through the dark and sinister streets of our beloved city. We provide tours featuring cryptids, true crime, hauntings, and so much more that'll make you say nope. We guarantee you'll find a tour to suit your tastes over in Nopeville, so come visit us sometime. I feel the truck come to a stop and open my eyes as the engine cuts off, stretching and looking out through the windshield then the passenger window. Looks like we've arrived. Must have fallen asleep, I guess. I look over at my partner in the driver's seat and he smiles. All rested up there, sleeping beauty? He asks. Har har. Very funny. But yeah, I feel pretty good now. Let's get this started so we can head home. I open my door and climb out of the truck as he chuckles behind me doing the same. As I get to the back of the truck, I look at the dark one-story home we've pulled up in front of and shudder. I enjoy this job as much as one can, but despite how many of these kinds of houses we check out, I still get the creeps. The trailer door opens and the ramp lowers with an obnoxious whir of the motor. We both climb inside and walk past our gear to look at the cork board our manager is filled with information about the case. His voice crackles through the truck radio with his last little tidbit for the night. Got the intel. Looks like this is going to be a tough one. We've had reports of violence, and it looks like they left in a hurry. I glance at my partner who rolls his eyes and shrugs. Can't imagine it'll be any tougher than any of our other calls. Don't sweat it. We'll be fine. I'm not so sure, but I nod and smile. We always are. I return my attention to the board of information while he starts gathering some gear to bring inside with him. I read aloud to him. Looks like we've got someone they believe is named Myra Taylor, drowned in the bathtub of the master bathroom and summoned with a Ouija board? Of course. What else? I roll my eyes and hear him chuckle his own amusement behind me. I continue. Family has noticed doors moving by themselves, objects being moved and thrown, one light bulb was burst out of nowhere in the living room, and disembodied knocking on windows and doors. Sounds fairly routine to me. Guess this should be simple enough. I turn to the gear mounted all down the wall of the trailer and grab myself a flashlight which I mount to my shoulder, and a UV flashlight, EMF reader, and a cross just in case. We grab the house key we've been provided on our way out of the trailer and casually stroll up to the front door letting ourselves in. The vibe is immediately different when we cross the threshold, and I once again feel a shiver up my spine. We've done investigations like this together for years, but this feeling never really goes away. I can feel his tension beside me as well, so I know he feels the same. He tries a light switch, but nothing happens. <sighs> the breaker must have been turned off by the owners or perhaps the spirit. 
Either way, now we have to find it and I just pray that it hasn't been blown. My partner tells me to just keep looking for signs of activity and he'll go find the breaker so we don't have to waste too much time. I feel like this is a bad idea, but agree anyway and proceed through the dark to where the master bedroom is, figuring it's my best bet. After several moments sweeping the room with the EMF and muttering questions to evoke any kind of response, my partner's voice comes over the radio saying he's got the power back on. I inform him that I haven't had any luck yet in the master bedroom and we agree to meet up in the kitchen to see if we can find anything there. He attempts contact with the spirit box while I walk the room with my EMF but everything seems fairly normal aside from the horribly oppressive vibe within the home. He suggests we head back out to the truck to grab some cameras and tripods to set up and watch from our computer setup in the trailer in case maybe our presence is making whatever haunts this place feel a bit shy. This feels unlikely, but it's as good a plan as any, so we head back outside, gather up several cameras and tripods, and trek back into the house. He decides to set his cameras up in the kitchen slash dining room, basement, and garage. I take mine to the master bedroom, setting up with a view into the bathroom as well, then one into the main hallway facing the front door, and finally the nursery near the front of the house. The sight of the small toys and furniture makes me feel a bit sad for the family being terrorized, until I see the teddy bear sat atop a shelf with its head turned backward. I instantly feel like we need to get out of this house and start hurrying out of the nursery, calling out to my partner that it's time to go. I run into him by the living room, and he seems confused, but he trusts my instincts, so we turn to rush toward the front door, which promptly slams shut and the sound of the deadbolt seems far louder in the sudden silence. Faintly, we can hear a cell phone buzz in one of the bedrooms deeper inside the home. We see the lights flicker near the kitchen and hear the patter of a few things being knocked or thrown around in there. The spirit box, which my partner had left on the kitchen counter, suddenly crackles to life, but the sounds coming from it aren't quite like the ones we're used to hearing. Distantly, we can still hear the static, but it's constant, and there seems to be what can only be called demonic whispering coming through it. This is already bad enough to put us on edge and have us searching for a safe place to hide, but then a female voice starts to speak through it as well. Being the smartass that he is, I hear my partner mutter under his breath, bit hard when you've locked us in here with you, love. The voice suddenly screams, You will die! Punctuated by the sound of glass shattering and the lights in the house getting snuffed out. We instinctively extinguish our flashlights as well, and he gently tugs up my arm, indicating for me to stay close and follow him. We move as quietly as possible and duck into a closet on the hallway with louvered doors. Staying as quiet as we possibly can, we wait, listening, but hearing nothing more. Even the spirit box seems to have gone dead as well. But then, there seems to be a quiet melodic humming coming from the direction of the kitchen. A familiar song. Gradually, the sound begins to become louder as the entity is, seems to be making its way closer to our location. She hasn't seen us. There's no way she could possibly know where we've gone. The sound reaches the closet, and to my horror, very slowly, almost idly, the door in front of me starts to open. Panicked, I pull it shut again quietly and hope that perhaps she didn't notice, but then the door in front of my partner does the same. He also manages to pull it shut quietly and we relax ever so slightly when we hear the humming start to move away from our closet as she seems to head for the nursery and other child's bedroom near the front of the house. Our relief is short-lived, however, as the humming draws near again and my breath catches as my closet door once again starts to open and his as well when I pull mine back shut. We decide now to firmly hold the doors shut as they begin to rattle, the spirit somehow thwarted by our efforts, but we don't question it and simply hold fast to keep the doors shut. This goes on for several long moments before the spirit, or perhaps demon for all we know, shrieks her rage, and with a final hard bang on the doors, everything stops again. The house is bathed in silence as thick as the darkness, but we remain motionless, firmly clinging to the doors just in case. Then, very faintly, we hear the deadbolt on the front door unlock. In unspoken agreement, we decide to take no chances as we fling open the closet doors and book it for the front door, which blessedly remains unlocked, and we are able to burst forth into the still night air. We waste no time gathering our equipment back up nor catching our breath. We lock the trailer back up and hop in the truck cabin, booking it out of there as quickly as we can. I've never feared for my life like I did that night in all the years I've been doing investigations, and I don't think I ever will again, especially since my partner and I have called it quits. You know, just to be safe. This is Dana from The Crime Diner. For your scary bedtime story, I thought I'd try my hand at a story that came from my own brain. I would like to warn you, any resemblance of real life people, places, or things in this story is strictly coincidental. Enjoy! 
Charlie woke up in a cold sweat, feeling like she was ripped from the deepest of sleep. She was trembling, and she couldn't catch her breath like she had been running a marathon just moments ago. Her heart was racing, and her mouth was bone dry. As she reached for the glass of water on her bedside table, flashes of the dream she had been having slammed her memory. God, it felt so real, so intense. She shook her head a little, trying to gather her thoughts and make sense of the things she had just seen in her dream. She had been running in the woods. The way her heart was racing made her think she had been running from something. But the feeling of rage that was slowly subsiding made her question if she had been running after something. She remembered the blood. There was so much blood on her hands, so much that she checked them while she was sitting in her bed to make sure she had only been dreaming. For a brief moment, she thought she remembered a voice, not her voice, a deep, raspy voice that made her shiver once more. Why was she having such a violent dream that seemed so odd? Charlie didn't usually dream, or if she did, certainly she didn't remember them. Her sleep was always so broken and disjointed, it never really allowed her to get a deep enough sleep for dreaming. But as she thought about it, while slowly taking sips of the water, she felt like she'd seen those woods. They looked familiar. It wasn't like a forest or anything. It reminded her of that little hidden trail that she had found one day while she was on a date with the last girl she let break her heart. <sighs> the lurch in her stomach when she thought of Brittany helped her forget momentarily how much that dream had shaken her. The sun was coming up. She knew she would never be able to get back to sleep. So she got up and decided to go back to the station. Maybe they'd allow her access to the evidence again, see if she could come up with anything else to help the case. Charlie was often recruited by police for her unique abilities to help with cases that were a little more difficult for them to solve on their own. Of course, anything she told the police that she'd seen in her visions was inadmissible in court, but most of the time she was able to get them pointed in the right direction when they were stuck. When she arrived at the station, Detective Kennedy was already sitting at a long table with all the evidence that was not out at the lab for testing. Clearly, he had not been able to sleep either. Kennedy wordlessly handed her the crime scene photos. He knew what she came to do. He knew that she was obsessed with the case just as much as he was. Charlie had seen these pictures what felt like a million times in the last week, but this morning, as soon as the photos touched her skin, the dream from just a few hours ago came crashing back. The tiny trail in the woods with Brittany flashed in her mind, and Detective Kennedy saw her visceral reaction. The body of the unknown woman had been found posed very graphically in the sand underneath the boardwalk. It was obvious to even the untrained eye that this murder had taken place somewhere else, since there was almost no actual evidence at the scene. They just didn't know where, and this woman had been mutilated. As cliche as it sounds, when detectives described the scene, they would say things like, they'd never been to a more gruesome crime scene, or they'd never seen anything so bad in all their years of police work. Charlie hated all the drama, which seemed odd to most people who would think a psychic for the police was by definition pretty damn dramatic. But this time she was inclined to agree with them. Police were still waiting on information from forensics to try and identify this woman. Charlie dropped the photos and squeezed her eyes so tightly that the darkness had flashes of light in it again. She rubbed both eyes with the heels of her hand, and when she opened them, Kennedy was staring at her expectantly. Well, what'd you see? I keep dreaming of this place I was last year. I can't imagine how it's related, but could we maybe take a ride? When Detective Kennedy pulled into the place Charlie had directed him to, he turned to her and could not believe that she would voluntarily go into these woods, on a date no less. What was she thinking? This place looked like no one would ever find it, even if they did know where it was beforehand. She knew exactly what he was thinking and told him to hush. Yes, she had a bit of a habit following cute girls into the woods for dates, but hey, we all have our flaws, right? Charlie leads the detective to the trail. She has to pull back some of the branches for both of them to fit through the opening, and when they do, they both get the surprise of a lifetime. Detective Kennedy saw the whole clearing covered in blood. The victim's hair had been cut off and strewn all over the trees and bushes. Her clothes were torn apart and flung everywhere. Charlie, however, was seeing something wildly different than the detective. She was witnessing the murder. Normally, when Charlie had a vision, it was from the sidelines. She wasn't part of the vision. She was just watching, like a spectator. But this, this was different. This felt like a memory. She was killing the woman. She was stabbing her over and over, and the rage she had was insurmountable all the while she was being cheered on by the most horrifying voice she had ever heard the same one from the dream it was deep and guttural and she could feel it vibrate in her whole body with every knife wound made into the woman's lifeless body she could feel the voice vibrate in her heart and course through her veins she could feel it like a rock in her stomach and deep in her bones egging her on and bolstering her up. When Detective Kennedy shook her back into existence, she immediately folded at the waist and threw up. What was going on here? What the hell was happening? 
And who the hell was this victim? Why was Charlie seeing herself actually committing the murder? That had never happened before. While Charlie was throwing up, Detective Kennedy was calling forensics to come secure the scene. And when he got off the phone, he had other news as well. They had ID'd the victim, 32-year-old Brittany Davis. And with that, Charlie fainted. Back at the station with a cold rag on the back of her neck, she ignored every single one of Kennedy's questions, and he was throwing them at her relentlessly. He never believed in the psychic bullshit before Charlie, but when she had come forward to help in that first case a few years ago, it was shocking how much she had known, how much she had helped. In the back of his mind, he thought it was a little weird, but there was never a link to any of the crimes before, and her information had always been solid. So why the hell, all of a sudden, does not only she lead him to the crime scene, but she had a relationship with the victim. Charlie could hear him, but she simply could not respond. She knows this looks bad, but there is no way she had anything to do with Brittany's death. She loved her. Yes, she was hurt how things ended, especially since she thought maybe this could have been for the long haul, but Charlie always did that kind of thing. Fell for the first beautiful woman who batted her eyelashes at her. Brittany felt different though, and it was hard to get over that breakup, but she had, she definitely had, right? But why in this vision? Was she mercilessly ending Brittany's life? And in her dream, she felt rage. Definite, unadulterated, pure hate. Fueled on by a voice of a monster inside her that she was longing to hear again. She knew now that she had not been running from something in that dream. She was definitely running after something. And that something was Brittany. And she was fucking thrilled to realize that. Hello, spooky friends. It's Autumn from Autumn's Oddities Podcast. Please enjoy a handcrafted selection of some of my own personal ghost stories. Hear my trauma. Hear my terror. Remember, if it's creepy and weird, you'll find it here. On to another just really, really, really weird one. This one involved my youngest sister. She's 10 years younger than me. And at the time that this happened, she was about two years old. We lived in the literal middle of nowhere in a 100 year old house that had once been a church. And this is some poltergeist bullshit because allegedly the cemetery on the property had been moved. But I highly, highly doubt that they actually moved any bodies. This house was rife with paranormal activity, but of course, we got shushed if we ever brought up anything that we saw or experienced. This house is going to come up again later. This was not a a good place to live. One night, I was, you know, doing the old-fashioned show in front of a full-length mirror before school. You know, you got to have your outfit right, even though, like, I was super young and a dork and was probably wearing, like, a giant t-shirt and something wholly unfashionable. And I heard my sister talking. Her bedroom door was right by the mirror. You know, it was on the wall in the hallway. And it was open just far enough so that I could actually see her. She was standing in her crib, holding onto the railing and looking up at something while kind of craning her neck upward, like she was staring at someone. She was talking, then waiting silently as if for a reply, then talking again and so on. It sounded like she was having a conversation, but I could not hear any responses. I was honestly pretty freaked out after listening to this for a few minutes. And finally, I asked her who she was talking to. She spun her head to look at me and the door slammed in my face. I tried to open it, but it would not budge. I yelled for my parents, but the door was locked from the inside. My dad actually had to use a coat hanger to pick the lock. They blamed the door slamming on the wind, but give me a break. There were no open windows and that is just not how physics works, my guys. Again, I was too young to know any better. When we finally got into the room, Uh, We asked her who she was talking to, and she very calmly replied, Papa Jean. No big deal, that's our maternal grandfather, but very big deal because he died when my mom was 16. None of us ever met him. My mom literally never talked about him or said his name. She has more in recent years, but cheers to good old fashioned Irish repression. And we would ask my sister for years afterward what her conversation with what I'm assuming was a ghost was about, or, you know, just to tell us about it at all. But she never would and seemed to get pretty irritated if we asked. Finally, at some point as an adult, she gave us some answers. Papal Jean used to come into her room, appearing as a shadow, and ask her about my mom, the kids, and our family in general. And this happened for years. 
but she has only really ever talked about it once, maybe twice in her life. I don't think that she likes to talk about it. Uh, if I hadn't literally been standing there listening to the conversation and had a door slammed in my face when I tried to go into the room, I would not have believed that she was talking to anyone at all. But the fact that she knew the name of our long dead grandfather and claimed to be speaking to him was too much of a coincidence and too elaborate a story for a two-year-old to concoct. I don't know what she was talking to. I kind of don't think it was him. We're going to get into that a little more later. Well, hang on to your butts for this one. Like literally, you are going to get chills at the end. My brother, um, I'll go ahead and name him. His name is Matt. I didn't want to name my sister. She's a teacher and I don't know if she wants her business out in the world. Was in kindergarten and his class had a field trip to the pumpkin patch. Yay! As we were getting ready to leave the house, my brother asked my dad to tie his shoes three times extra tightly because he didn't want them to fly off. All right. Uh, my dad thought this was a weird request, but he did it anyway. You know, kids say weird shit all the time. If you've ever been around kids, you can confirm. Anyway, kindergartners were riding on the school bus and the parents, you know, slash families that wanted to go followed behind in their cars. This was a really popular field trip. Pretty much everybody went with their families if they had a kid in the kindergarten class. The roads were very narrow, almost one lane country roads with no shoulder at all. And in some places, a pretty steep drop. So we're just driving along and my sister, another sister, probably was singing too loudly and I'm telling her to shut up or something like that. It's just a normal day until we're not far from the pumpkin patch and we watch as the bus tips over and rolls partially down a hillside. It was absolute chaos. There were no seatbelts in buses then, not sure if there are now, but no one knew if the kids inside were dead, injured, no one knew anything. It was just a nightmare. All kids were taken to the local hospital, and luckily, most of them were only mildly injured with a few broken bones. It obviously could have been much, much worse. Imagine if it had tipped at one of those points where there was a steep drop. I really don't want to. But take a wild guess what was laying all over the road around that overturned school bus. Children's shoes. Yeah. So to recap, my brother wanted his shoes tied extra tightly so that they wouldn't fly off. He specifically requested that. My dad was kind of messed up about it. Uh, my brother did not have an explanation as to why he made that request or how he knew that something was going to happen. I think that he may be clairvoyant, to be honest. I'm telling you, that one haunts me. How could he have possibly known to request that his shoes be tied extra tightly so that they wouldn't fly off. Like, did he see something? Some sort of final destination premonition? I'm not sure, but he has battled a lot of personal demons over the years, over the decades, really, and seems to have now come out on the other side. And I can't help but wonder if the fact that he sees things has something to do with some of the issues that he's had. Hello, my spooky friends. My name is Keely, and I'm the host of Missy Mysteries a true crime and paranormal podcast. As we go into the spookiest day of the year, tonight I will be telling you one of the scariest urban legends, the ghost of Bloody Mary, and just how you may be able to summon her this Halloween. Grab your candy, grab your sweet treats, and your hot chocolate, and let's dive in. There are many origins to just who Bloody Mary was in life. But the one I grew up hearing was about Queen Mary, or Mary Tudor, the daughter of King Henry VIII, and Catherine. After King Henry's death in 1547, her younger half-brother King Edward VI took the throne but died at the age of 15 in 1553. Mary forcibly took the throne from Edward's cousin, who he had named during sickness, to try to keep the line Protestant. Mary taking the throne made her the first queen to receive the English crown from her birth order rather than being married to a king. During her rule, Mary gained the name Bloody Mary due to 280 executions of Protestants who opposed her rule under the Catholic Church. Queen Mary died in 1558, although the ritual to summon her can only be linked back to the 1970s. This ritual is much like a game young women have played for centuries, 
to see if their future husband would appear in the mirror while they did the ritual, or if they saw a skull skeleton behind them, it means they would die before they married. But instead, you are summoning the spirit of Blenny Mary. To start this ritual, you will take a candle and go into a dark room or bathroom alone. It is very important that you're alone, and of course, that it's dark. Hold the candle or set it down in front of you as you stand in front of the mirror and light it. Look into the mirror, then close your eyes while saying Bloody Mary three times slowly and clearly. When you open your eyes, you may see the spirit of Bloody Mary standing behind you while the mirror drips with blood, maybe even cracked. This is if she hasn't already scratched her eyes out. If you're lucky enough, you will blow out the candle, ending the ritual, and leave the bathroom. But be careful, because reflections are everywhere, and you never know what reflection you may see her in next. Hey there, my name's Sarai, and I host a spooky podcast called Freaky AF. I was born with a medical condition. Doctors have never been able to tell me exactly what it is, but if my body temperature goes anywhere above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I start having convulsions. I'm also susceptible to having fevers anytime I get sick with practically any ailment, so you can imagine how much of a germaphobe I've grown to be. This one night, it got really bad. I was around 8 years old at the time, and I can remember my mom giving me some NyQuil to help fight the fever and to hopefully lull me to sleep. It's tough to get a wink of shut-eye when your body is burning up at a whopping 104 degrees. It was miserable. I could feel the medicine working its magic on me, and my eyes began to slowly shut. One thing I always hated about running a fever was that my mom absolutely forbade me to cover with a heavy comforter. For some reason, I can't sleep with just any kind of blanket. It's gotta be thick and fluffy. Something that I can lose myself in so that it feels like I'm sleeping on a cloud. But whenever I was running a fever, my mom would force me to sleep with one of those thin, flimsy covers which I guess was better for my temperature, but I most definitely wasn't happy about it. Nonetheless, she'd at least let me sleep with my rotary fan on the low setting, because if there's no fan sounds, you can just forget about it. I felt my body fall deeper and deeper into slumber when something suddenly pulls me back. A noise, and a loud one, at that. It's my fan, but why is it so loud? Not only does it sound like it's on full blast, but it's as if it's blowing right into my ear. I can see the fan sitting on the other side of the room, and it seems normal, but something's off. This place I'm in looks like my room, but I can't help but have a feeling that it isn't. My bedroom door is open. It's never left open. And so is the door to my closet, and my closet light is on? But why? Suddenly, lightning strikes and a huge thunderclap follows it. I can hear my dog, Raja, crying from the living room. She's not typically scared of thunderstorms. I can hear her claws tapping on the hardwood floors as she comes towards my bedroom. She jumps onto the bed and rests herself on top of my body, still whining at the thunder. I try to lift my hand to pet her, to assure her that everything's going to be alright, but before I could, she growls and suddenly takes my arm into her mouth. I can feel the tight grasp of her jaw as it's clamping down on my wrist. She bites down harder when I make even the slightest movement, so I stay still. My heart is pounding. I can feel the wet blood flowing from my wrist and soaking the bed beneath me. I can feel Raja's weight on me, pushing down on my stomach and sinking me deeper into the mattress, making it hard for me to breathe as I gasp for air out of sheer panic. Suddenly, everything goes quiet. Like, someone pressed the mute button on the entire world. The pain that I was experiencing just moments ago turns into a new feeling. A feeling far worse than any pain. The feeling of dread. I was paralyzed by it. I couldn't even scream or cry for help. When I saw it, standing in my closet, it was a shadow of a person, I think? More like something impersonating a person. Whatever it was, I could tell that it was watching me. Every inch of my being wanted nothing more than to run and hide from the thing's wretched presence. But I couldn't feel anything. Just fear. Pure fear. I shut my eyes as hard as I could to the point where I swear my eyelids would tear. And when I opened them again, it was morning. 
Immediately, I went to inspecting my wrist to assess the damage, and nothing. Not a single mark. My glance shot to my closet door, and it was closed. I could hear Raja scratching at my bedroom door, crying for me to let her in, and when I opened it, she greeted me with a wagging tail. She went for my hand to give it a lick, and I snatched it back so fast I hadn't even meant to. It was just a reaction, really. I was afraid of my closet for a good while after that. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that I never entered that closet without my mom until after we moved out of that house. After that, I was sure that that was the last I'd ever see of the shadow. That is until it revealed itself to me again, a decade and a half later. I'm Angelina from Murder Murder News, and each week on our show, we tell a story from the corresponding week in true crime history, with a focus on the victim's perspective. New episodes of Murder Murder News drop every Friday on all major podcast platforms. Jane wore a yellow ribbon around her neck every day. And I mean every day. Rain or shine. Whether it matched her outfit or not. It annoyed her best friend Johnny after a while. He was her next-door neighbor and had known Jane since she was three. When he was young, he had barely noticed the yellow ribbon, but now they were in high school together, it bothered him. Why do you wear that yellow ribbon around your neck, Jane? He'd ask her every day, but she wouldn't tell him. Still, in spite of this aggravation, Johnny thought she was cute. He asked her to the soda shop for an ice cream sundae. Then he asked her to watch him play in the football game. Then he started seeing her home. And come spring, He asked her to the dance. Jane always said yes when he asked her out, and she always wore a yellow dress to match the ribbon around her neck. It finally occurred to Johnny that he and Jane were going steady, and he still didn't know why she wore the yellow ribbon around her neck. So he asked her about it yet again, and yet again she did not tell him. Maybe someday I'll tell you about it, she'd reply. Someday. That answer annoyed Johnny. But he shrugged it off because Jane was so cute and fun to be with. Well, time flew past, as it has a habit of doing, and one day Johnny proposed to Jane and was accepted. They planned a big wedding, and Jane hinted that she might tell him about the yellow ribbon around her neck on their wedding day. But somehow, what with the preparations, and his beautiful bride, and the lovely reception, Johnny never got around to asking Jane about it. And when he did remember, She got a bit teary-eyed and said, We're so happy together. What difference does it make? And Johnny decided she was right. Johnny and Jane raised a family of four with the usual ups and downs, laughter and tears. When their golden anniversary rolled around, Johnny once again asked Jane about the yellow ribbon around her neck. It was the first time he brought it up since the week of their wedding. Whenever their children asked him about it, he'd always hush them. And somehow, none of the kids dared ask their mother. Jane gave Johnny a sad look and said, Johnny, you've waited this long. You can wait a while longer. And Johnny agreed. It was not until Jane was on her deathbed a year later that Johnny, seeing his last chance slip away, asked Jane one final time about the yellow ribbon she wore around her neck. She shook her head a bit at his persistence and then said with a sad smile, Okay, Johnny, you can go ahead and untie it. With shaking hands, Johnny fumbled for the knot and untied the yellow ribbon around his wife's neck, and Jane's head fell off. Hi, this is Jenna. And this is Kelly. And you're listening to our OBFM Halloween special. Aren't you excited? I'm excited. We're with so many other podcasts. On Amazing this nar- podcast. Yes, yes. On this network, and we're so excited to be featured in it. So, Kelly is going to share a story first. Uh, do you believe in werewolves? Will I by the end of the story? No. <laughs> I I am on the fence about Bigfoot. I'm, I'm okay. on the fence. Okay, but you're, you're open werewolves. to it. Werewolves. But this guy, he, he certainly believed in it. Um, in 2018, Let's so he's a 34-year-old Pankaj Bossing. Well, he walked into a window store in Alexandria, Virginia. He needed to check some boxes that he believed had human DNA. Like, oh, okay. yes. So he then, when he's going to check these boxes, he sees Brad Jackson, who's a 65-year-old manager of the store. And he he presumes that Brad would have some knowledge about, quote, 
boxes with human DNA. So weird. So the two get in an argument because I don't know what you mean by boxes with DNA. And Punk Jaw's like, come on, no, you know about this. <laughs> After the interaction, Punkaj believed that Brad was turning into a werewolf. He just decided As one does when you get into an uh, yeah. argument. Maybe he had figured Brad had too much werewolf DNA to recognize human DNA. But doesn't that mean he is like better like sniffing ability? <laughs> His reasoning does not hold water. For uh-uh. <laughs> no. It would go opposite that. He would be yeah. less of a werewolf. Okay. So in reaction to this, he stabbed Brad over 50 times. Holy shit. Gouged his eyes out with a box knife. That so, escalated quickly. Very fast. Brad was found with cuts to his head, neck, and torso with a box cutter nearby. A dry erase marker also was believed to be in the, used in the tech because the marker's cap was found embedded in Brad's body. Okay. Like, was he trying to stab him with the marker? Don't you need a <laughs> silver bullet? Was Not a silver. an expo pen. <laughs> Maybe it was a silver expo pen, and he's like, it's <laughs> good enough. A UPS driver, he's delivering boxes at the building. He goes to drop off a package, and he's like, he sees a man kneeling on the floor praying. He's like, okay, not totally weird. A little weird, not okay. totally weird. Right. So then, he, you know, he's going about his business. Then he sees this same man run out of the second floor business and jump into a Mercedes parked on the street. A woman and her child were in the Mercedes when the now naked Pankaj jumped into the okay, backseat. At what point now did naked. he get naked? Uh, <laughs> when, when did that happen? Why Maybe he, he was turning into a werewolf and he didn't want to rip his clothes. Right. I don't know. The, the, the guy was that jumped out was naked. Did he not he's, notice that? Like, <gasps> well, if he was hairy enough because he was turning into a werewolf. True. Oh, oh the rest of the marker, though. So it was later found in the Mercedes with Pankaj. The mom, she's in there. She's screaming for him to get out. They don't know this guy. With the mom and the kids still <gasps> in there. Instead, he was not getting out. So they jumped out and they locked him in until the police get there. <laughs> Does he not know how to use the door locks? Maybe not. Maybe he's in the back seat and there are no unlockers back there. You know, sometimes. <laughs> or on the front, if you're a mom, you can lock it so they can't be unlocked from the back. And somehow <laughs> they kept them in there. So cops arrive. They find Pankaj in the car with the capless dry race marker and Brad dead in the business. Oh a God. medical examiner later determined Brad had died of multiple blunt force and sharp force injuries. So while he's been, being arrested, Pankaj told police, I killed the wolf and that there was still time to save 99% of the moon and planets. I don't know if he was running on all cylinders or he knows something we don't know, but it was very important information at the time. And something was off. Just saying. Either that one know. person had all the information to the secrets of the universe or it's... And this was 2018 and we're all yeah, still team. here, so I mm-hmm. think I, we're all right. A jury never came to the consensus if... Pakaj was even fit to stand trial. They hear the same story you just told uh, yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> I think, and then some, because I bet I don't have all the details. Right. But yeah. the judge decided that he needed to serve time in a mental institution. He he spent three years there and was released 2021. Killed somebody. In a really freaking horrid way, not... Yeah. Right. So, hairy people out there, beware. <laughs> this guy's back on the street. Exactly. Beware, because uh, his release is conditional on the long list of requirements. So Pankaj must take his medication, thank God, submit to drug and alcohol testing. This is weird. Pay for his own GPS monitor, but please don't make him go get a job somewhere. That is scary. Well, yeah, I mean, I understand he should have to pay for it himself, but how does he? Can oh, he hold it, a job? I don't, I don't know. I think they said it's it was a severe bipolar. Anyway, he must okay. he, he must either live with his parents in Alexandria or Fairfax County, or he has the option to move into a part, an apartment that's tied with a mental health agency, but the parent must still live nearby. I mean, he's okay. in his 30s. It's not like he's a kid. Oh, and okay. he has home visits by community service support I, staff. Thank God. But Pankaj but. just got into trouble again after posting on online dating sites all over the place. This is pretty good. He described himself as an easygoing adventurer who believes in universal connection. But it gets better. He says that he's been away for a couple years traveling. Yeah. He was traveling, but just his mind and his, his mind. body was still here. <laughs> his body was in an institution. Can you imagine meeting somebody on an online dating site and then thinking, you know, I really like this person. Yeah. I'm going to just do a quick background check. That's what comes up. Horrifying. And I think he had a different name on his online dating sites. 
It was like PK or something, so, you know. Uh, what it doesn't say, yeah, that is, he's nicknamed the werewolf killer in the neighborhood. Um, and his vacation was really a three year stint in a Northern Virginia mental institution. But family member of the deceased, Brad Jackson, Jackson actually came across the dating profile and took screenshots, sent it to the prosecutors. They didn't even know. Ah, so now they have recently filed a motion to bar him from using social media or to require software that allows his social media to be supervised. So yeah. the judge did order that he has to take down his social media profiles. And yeah, he said that he agreed with prosecutors that the descriptions were intentionally misleading. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm a werewolf hunter. Right. And in my spare time. In my spare time. Oh, this guy. But as long as he's on his meds, I hope everything is well. Holy yes. crap. So that's the story yeah. of someone who believes in werewolves anyway. Okay, Halloween. let's hear your story. All right, so mine's pretty Halloween-y too. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a Natalie Moskvin, who is a genius Russian historian, linguist, and a phylogist. Phylogy is the study of language in oral and written historical sources and literary texts. Ooh, and very cool. So he's he's a certified genius. He speaks 13 languages. He was a college professor and a journalist. Oh, like when you see those uh, Egyptian manuscripts and those types. Of, yeah, he of reads all of, that stuff, wow, right? Wow, that's awesome. He was born September 1st, 1966 in Gorky, Soviet Russia, which is now known as Nizhny Novgorod, Russia. I don't know. Wow. It's, it's the fifth largest city in the country. He considers himself, he's a self-proclaimed expert in the city's cemeteries. Hey, I love cemeteries, honestly, so... There's loving much. them, and then there's oh. a Natalie. His main area of academic interests were Celtic history and folklore, as well as languages and linguistics, but he was fascinated with studying cemeteries, burial rituals, and the occult. Those okay. are some interesting, weird yeah, things. Yeah, totally. People, people get into that. Not totally necessarily weird. a red flag, right? He had over 60,000 books and documents and a large doll 60. collection. People described him as both a genius and eccentric, which, okay. again, none of this is really that weird. And Natalie, or however you say his name, he never dated. He's always lived with his parents. He's uh -huh. reportedly, he's never smoked, never drank. He was a regular contributor to Necrologies, which is a weekly publication about cemeteries and obituaries. He wrote an article in October of 2011 where he discussed how his dark obsession began. Oh, this is where things mm -hmm. start to get creepy. In this article, he explains how in 1970, when he was about 13 years old, a group of men in black suits stopped him on the way home from school. And they were headed to the funeral of an 11 year old girl named yeah. Natasha Petrova. The men took him with them and forced him to kiss the girl's corpse. What the? What? What purpose would that serve at all? Uh, like hoping I, to wake her up like she's Snow White I don't or something? Know, right, like she's Snow White. <laughs> it wasn't just like, at first I was like, wow, these, this sounds like a bunch of assholes. Well, yeah. it gets a little weirder. A quote from the article reads An adult pushed my face down to the waxy forehead of the girl in an embroidered cap and there was nothing I could do but kiss her as ordered. He wrote, I kissed her once, then again and again. The girl's grieving mother put a wedding ring on his what? finger and one on her dead daughter, daughter's finger. Ooh, and even kid. at that point, he wrote, my strange marriage with Natasha Petrova was useful, he said, because it what? led him to a belief in magic and a fascination with the dead. I realize this mother is probably in a state of crisis because her daughter died. Her but... young daughter died. In 2005, a fellow academic commissioned him to summarize and list the dead in more than 700 cemeteries in the 40 regions that surrounded this Nidsi hmm. Novgorod or whatever. And Natalie claims that from 2005 to 2007, he visited 752 cemeteries in his hometown. He would take detailed notes and then research the histories of those buried there. He claims that to have walked up to 20 miles per day during this, sometimes wow. sleeping on hay bales and uh, drinking rainwater from puddles. Okay, that seems excessive. I don't know if you <laughs> need to be that devoted Again, to that. Work. There were weekly newspaper newspapers that published documentaries of his research with titles like Great Walks Around Cemeteries and 
what the dead said. He yeah. even said that he spent a night sleeping in a coffin that had been set up for a person's funeral the next day. Mm. He said, this looks comfortable. So, you know, all this is really odd. In 2009, people in the area began finding graves of their loved ones dug up or desecrated. Mm. Natalie had been questioned multiple times by police while he was researching, but he was never arrested or detained or anything because he would show his, you know, academic credentials and be like, this is why I'm here. I'm doing this research. Mm -hmm. But then on November 2nd, 2011, 46 year old Natalie was arrested by police who were investigating several desecrations of Muslim graves when they found him painting over pictures of the deceased. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but apparently after he was arrested, eight police officers then went to the apartment that he shared with his parents. Mm -hmm. and found a scene that will forever um, haunt their dreams. Okay. Inside... It's like Norman Bates thing. Like I'm expecting a Norman Bates Oh, God. Oh. Inside, authorities found 26 life-sized doll-like <gasps> figures. It was a very cluttered, very hoarder-like uh, mm -hmm. place. There were stacks of books and papers, very little space to walk. The large dolls were in various styles of dress. Some had like knee-high boots. Others had like the, you know, the little strappy patent letter Mary, Mary Jane type yeah, shoes, some like girls' dress school, shoes, some right? Like... Some of them had their faces and hands covered in fabric, and then makeup applied over mm. the fabric on their faces. Ugh, that's All creepy. of their hands and legs were hidden in fabric. And upon further inspection, they realized these were not dolls. These were the mummified corpses of human girls. When police moved one of the bodies, it played music. It was like a music box. <laughs> so when they realized oh inside God. their chests, he had embedded either music boxes or toys so they would make sound when he touched them. Police also found plaques that were removed from gravestones, instructions on like how he made the dolls and like just general doll making instructional <laughs> booklets, you know, maps of local cemeteries and a collection of photographs and videos showing graves uh -oh. being opened and then disinterred bodies. <sighs> It became apparent that the clothes worn by the dolls were the clothes the girls were buried in. One girl had a piece of her own gravestone that had her name mm -hmm. on it embedded inside her. Another had the hospital tag with her date and cause of death. Aww. And a third had a dried human heart inside her. On YouTube, you can watch the police video of the apartment showing the dolls uh, seated what? on shelf. Oh, I'm not kidding you. Uh, they're on shelves oh. or sofas or piles of paper. And I, you, I mean, don't think I can watch it. I can't be unseen once you see that shit. You can't, right. No. <clears throat> did you nope. watch it? Of course I did. Oh. At least you don't know exactly what they're saying because it's all in Russian. Yes, thank <laughs> God. But it was later discovered that most of the girls came from local cemeteries and some may have come from as far away as Moscow. They ranged in age from three to 25. Three? Dude, uh -huh. that is not your child bride, honey. Uh -huh. And one corpse he had in his possession for almost nine years. And Natalie was very cooperative with police, and he told them that he made the dolls over a period of 10 years. Um, his parents spent most of the year away from the apartment, and so mm. at the time of his arrest, his mother, 76-year-old Elvira, she was mm. quoted saying, We saw these dolls, but we did not suspect there were dead bodies inside. We thought it was his hobby to make such big dolls and did not see anything wrong with it. Neighbors, of course, were shocked. They said that he was quiet and his parents were nice people, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they did note a rancid smell oh. that came from the apartment whenever he opened the door. But they kind of chalked it up to, you know, it's Russia. There's a lot of yeah. really old buildings. There's a lot of vague rotting smell that you find oh. in the basements of these buildings. <laughs> so again, how depressed are these people? Because that smell did yeah. not... That didn't shock them. <laughs> Detectives found shoes in the apartment that matched footprints near the desecrated graves that they were investigating. So like, we're pretty sure we got the right guy. As well as numerous grave decorations and burial mm. accessories like metal nameplates taken off headstones, that kind of stuff. Although only 26 bodies were discovered, they suspect that he desecrated about 150 graves. He admitted to drying the corpses using a combination of salt and baking soda and then 
he would store the bodies in secure, dry places around the cemetery. So he did this at the cemetery. He dried them out at the cemetery. Once they had dried, he brought them home where he turned them into dolls as, this is how he explained it, this was a temporary solution until he could discover a way to bring them back to life. He prettied them up because he Ooh. felt that their physical remains were too decayed and ugly for them to feel really comfortable and happy. And he was, he was <laughs> thinking of them. So he would wrap their limbs in like strips of cloth mm. and stuff their body cavities with mm. rags and padding. You know, in America, skinny is good. True. You know, in true, Russia, true. you know, you want to look like you're well yeah. fed. Well fed is popular. Right. Cause that means yeah. you have money to, you know. Damn. I'd be um, so popular. So he would put sheer nylons or pantyhose like over their faces and hands so that they their actual skin wouldn't be exposed. Sometimes he gave them wax masks. I have a picture of one. Of oh, that sounds horrifying. And then he'd paint them with nail polish because you know oh. you don't want your makeup to fade. On some, he put buttons or toys no. in their eye socket so that they could watch cartoons no, with him. Oh, that's horrifying. Then he dressed them in brightly colored clothing with hoods or gave them wigs. Oh, he God. explained that he made the dolls because he was lonely and his biggest mm. dream was to have children. And he said he tried to adopt, but the Russian adoption agencies <laughs> wouldn't let him because he didn't make enough money. He denied having any sexual attraction to the dolls and considered them to be his children. Mm -hmm. He would talk to them. He'd interact with them. Mm -hmm. He celebrated holidays for them. Yeah. He held mm -hmm. birthday parties. I guess he probably hung 26 stockings on the fireplace. Oh, I don't know. God. Now Real. looking, but see, they were liter they literally mm -hmm. were stuffed. In court, he confessed to 44 counts of abusing graves and corpses. This is why Jesus. I couldn't do one doll for murder. He didn't yeah, murder was, anything. <laughs> in court, he addressed the victim's parents saying, mm -hmm. you abandoned your girls. What? I brought them home and warmed them up. God. He told authorities, don't bother reburying them too deeply. <gasps> I'm simply going to dig them back up when I'm released. In a hearing in 2012, the court deemed him unfit to stand trial, and they released him from any criminal liability. Uh -huh. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and sentenced to time in a psychiatric ward. While in treatment, and Natalie explained how his hobby began 20 years earlier while searching the obituaries for recently deceased children. I know that older people will search the obituaries because right, they look for friends. people they know died. Like <laughs> he was looking for children, right? And when he would find an obituary that spoke to him, yeah. He would go to their grave and sleep on it mm -mm. in order to determine if the spirit wished to be brought back to life. I'm he sorry, insisted no. that when he began, he never dug up a grave without the permission of the deceased <laughs> child inside. As he got older, it became physically painful for him to sleep on the graves. So naturally, he began bringing the bodies home so that oh, he naturally. Would be, it would be more comfortable for him to sleep near them, right? No. Plus, no. he thought the spirits would be more willing to speak in a safe, welcoming home. And then it would be easier to hear them when they were speaking if they weren't underground. It was hard to uh, hear. Natalia Kardimova, ooh. the mother of 10-year-old Olga, did not know that the grave she had visited for nine years was empty. <gasps> she was quoted saying, I still find it hard to grasp the scale of his sickening work, but for nine years he was living with my mummified daughter in his bedroom. Oh. She oh. said, I had her for 10 years, he had her for nine. Six years later, in September of 2018, there was a hearing that would give him the opportunity to continue his psychiatric treatment in his own home. His doctors believed he was no longer dangerous and petitioned the court to release him for outpatient care. As of April of 2022, he was given a new diagnosis in the hopes of ending his incarceration in the hospital where he's lived for the last 10 years. Uh, okay. He is now 55 years old and his new diagnosis is simply incapacitated. And this would mean that he could be released to live with friends or relatives. And Natalie said he wants to marry his girlfriends and he wants to work as a foreign languages tutor, but he still refuses to apologize to the families mm. of his victims. Right now he's just incapacitated, but I don't know. We'll have to like watch the news to see uh, if he gosh. actually gets this. Yeah. So there you go. We, we yeah. managed to do the true crime Halloween creepy ass special. special. Thanks for joining us. And we hope you'll listen to our regular show 
ODFM yes. podcast, which comes out weekly on Mondays. Thank Thanks you. Listening. Thanks, StarCast. Hey, I'm Gina. My co-host Amber and I host the Weird True Crime podcast, where we cover true crime cases that will leave you asking yourself, did that really happen? We'll dive into well-known and not-so-known cases throughout history. Some are unsolved and some are just unbelievable. We'll also talk about current news topics that range from kooky to questionable on episodes that we like to call Weird Headlines. Be sure to subscribe and listen on your favorite podcast service. The house I grew up in on Stout Oak Trail was built in the early 80s in one of those cookie cutter neighborhoods with a set amount of floor plans scattered among each other. My parents bought our house in 1986 when I was just an infant and I remember getting weird vibes when I was around four or five years old. It wasn't a big house, 1800 square feet, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, kitchen, living room, you know, the standard stuff. But my bedroom always gave me the creeps. I never liked sleeping in it because I always felt like something was watching me from one of the corners of the room. I'd beg for my mom to sleep with me or find a way into their room pretty much every night because I was so uneasy. I had frequent nightmares about being stuck in our old Ford Bronco while it was driven by a disembodied hand, beating through traffic, crashing through buildings. I'd also dream of a man in a long black cape with a black rimmed hat walking down the sidewalk on my street at night. Getting up to the bathroom was like being in my own horror movie. It was right across the narrow hallway lit up with a nightlight, but I always felt like something was right behind me on my trip to and from the bathroom. I'd usually run as fast as I could back to my room and shut the door, but then I still had to contend with whatever was watching me from the corner. My brother, who was 15 years older than me, moved in and out of the house a few times during my childhood. He would talk of hearing doors open and close at night when everyone was asleep. I heard it too on occasion. My bedroom window faced the space between our house and the neighbor's house, and we would hear someone whistling a tune sometimes at night in that direction. My mom always heard it too, but there was never anyone there. My brother finally moved out for good and I decided I was tired of my creepy ass room, so I moved into his. I no longer had that feeling that someone was watching me, but I wasn't in the clear. As I got older, I noticed my things going missing pretty frequently. Candy on the desk, a pencil, small trinkets or hair accessories or makeup just suddenly gone. And I mean gone, I would never find them again. One night, I was sitting on my floor listening to music on my giant 20-disc CD player looking at myself in my full-length wall mirror hung on the back of my door. Suddenly, a Beanie Baby I had propped up on top of my giant computer monitor goes flying across the room. It didn't just topple off like maybe I had bumped the desk and it fell off. It went flying and landed several feet away from where it was sitting. I remember jumping up and running out to tell my mom. I can't remember her exact reaction, but it was definitely along the lines of, oh, the ghost just wanted to play, or something like that. This was probably the most obvious thing that ever happened in my home. My friend Amber, however, who lived in the same floor plan one street over, wasn't so lucky. You see, Amber it lived in a mirror image of my house. We slept in the same bedroom. When Amber was a young kid, she remembers coming down with the cold or the flu and absolutely dreading it. Not because it's miserable being sick, but because of the nightmares that she always had. She didn't have bad dreams or nightmares very often when she wasn't ill, but every time she got sick, she had the same nightmares. All were about the man in the tall black hat. One of the worst ones she had was before she was even 10 years old and she was still living in her family's lime green trailer before her little brother was born. She got a cold and had a dream that the man in the tall black hat was tearing up the bed trying to get her. The dream itself wasn't a movie-like dream, but more of an abstract feeling. The only discernible thing about him was his hat and that he was tall and wearing all black, almost like a business suit. Fast forward to after her brother was born and they moved into the house on Hardwood Trail, the mirror image of mine. She got sick and dreamt about the man in the tall black hat again, but this time, other than the man, everything was super vivid. She told her mom about it, and she had never told her before about any of these dreams. All the color drained from her mom's face when she told her about the dream and described the man in the tall black hat. Her mother told her that she had a dream about the same man. Tall, 
no discernible facial features, tall black hat, and wearing all black. In her dream, the doorbell rang and she answered it to find the man in the tall black hat standing on the other side. He didn't say a word to her, but after a moment he tried to reach through the door and grab her. Her mom dodged out of the way and proceeded to shut the door on the man. But before the door closed, she saw him look over her head at the back door that was directly behind her on the other side of the living room. She turned and ran to the back door and slammed it shut just in time for him to start banging on the door. He had made it around the house to the back door in the time it took her to cross the room. After that, he just banged on every door and window in the house until she woke up from her dream. A few days later, her mom was telling her sister about the dreams and to their surprise, she informed them that her three kids also had nightmares about a man in a tall black hat. Oddly enough though, once Amber told her mom about the dreams, neither of them dreamt of him again. The man in the black hat wasn't the only thing Amber's mom experienced in their house on Hardwood Trail. She was vacuuming one day in the narrow hallway between the bedrooms when she looked up and saw a little boy standing in the doorway to the master bedroom. She guessed he was about four years old. He was wearing overalls with a long-sleeved white shirt underneath and tennis shoes. His hair was almost white. It was so blonde and he had blue eyes. He just looked at her for a moment and then he was gone. Along with the little ghost boy, Amber's house on Hardwood Trail was constantly making her family second guess what they saw or heard. All of them, even her dad, who never believed in anything even remotely paranormal, would hear a radio playing in the middle of the night. They would get up and check every room in the house to make sure there was nothing on, or they would even check outside to see if someone was blasting the radio. But everything was silent. They couldn't make out the song or what the voices were saying, but it was easy to tell that it was like an old-timey radio station of some sort. Several nights they would be woken up by this radio playing and could never figure out where it was coming from. To add to that, I remember one night when I was sleeping over at Amber's house and we were watching the movie Grease in her living room. There was a night light plugged into the end of the kitchen counter that started flickering erratically before turning off. I always had the same feeling of being watched in her house too. Now fast forward 15 years and Amber currently lives in a house on Iron Oak that's about five doors down from the house she grew up in on Hardwood Trail. When she had her daughter, she got a Graco baby monitor to set up in her room and a noise machine to help her sleep. At first they just used the white noise setting on there since they just wanted it to not be so silent. But one night she was sitting out in the garage with her mom and her husband Patrick and had the monitor with her. All of a sudden they hear a man's voice coming from the monitor. They couldn't make out what he was saying or anything at first and thought it was just interference from a neighbor or something. But then that old timey music started and it sounded just like the radio she heard all of those years before. The next morning she changed the machine to play lullaby and never used the white noise again. While visiting the house on Iron Oak, Amber's mom was in a front bedroom when she heard Amber's oldest daughter say, hello? When turning to look, she realized she was alone. The voice wasn't faint or quiet though, like a person standing right next to her had said hello. But her granddaughter had been in the kitchen on the other side of the house the whole time. When I got to college, one of my professors brought in a paranormal investigator to talk to us about the haunted history of the oldest building on campus. Of course, this was like the highlight of my semester and I took the opportunity to chat with him about my childhood home. You see, my neighborhood has a sad history. There was a family that lived in a house like mine at the end of my street in 1989. The husband was not a good man. He had a successful business, but stashed all of his earnings at the office, forcing his wife and three children to live off of oatmeal. His shitty ways finally caught up to him and his business shut down. He took up a paper route in the neighborhood. He and his wife were going through a nasty divorce and were in quite a custody battle over their three small children. One morning after his paper route, while the mom was asleep on the couch, the husband decided if he couldn't have the kids, no one could. So he barricaded himself and his children in one of the bedrooms in the home with a dining room table made from an antique door that was given to them by my next door neighbors. He set the room on fire, killing himself and the kids. I told the investigator about the happenings in my home and my friend's home. I also told him about the sweet babies who lost their lives much too soon due to greed and anger. He solidified my thoughts that day about why these things were happening in our houses. The spirits of this broken man and his children were drawn to our houses because they were familiar and close by. 
the kids probably wanted to play or be seen, which is why they stole items, tossed my toys, and appeared to Amber's mom. The darker feeling was the man hovering over me while I slept or following me in the halls, opening and closing doors, whistling between the houses. The investigator said Amber probably had more intense occurrences because her house was closer to the house where it happened. It made me wonder if other people in the same floor plan ever had weird happenings in their home. My parents still live in that house, and now my kids spend the night in my old room when they stay with them. They are nine and six, and neither have ever said anything about eerie or uneasy feelings while sleeping there. Though, even at 37, I still get weird vibes. Hi everyone, my name is Raven, and I'm the host of Rogue Darkness Podcast. As part of the Darkcast Network and in honor of spooky season, I wanted to share a personal story with you that I can only describe as paranormal. I've had several odd and what I would personally consider paranormal experiences, from a plethora of shadow people encounters, to taps and thuds from within the walls, to seeing someone coming up the stairs when in reality, no one was there. The story I'm going to be telling you had happened to me close to 15 years ago when I was babysitting one of my mom's friend's children. They had one of those toy Ouija boards that glows in the dark that you can find at most toy stores, complete with a plastic planchette. Not something most would deem as a legit Ouija board used to commune with the dead. At that point in time, I had never played with anything like that before, so I wanted to give it a try to see if we could make any type of contact with the other side. So me and the girl sat down at their kitchen table and each one of us put our fingers on the planchette. She asked if anyone was there with us, but there was no response. We waited a few minutes, then I asked the same question, is anyone here in the room with us? Still no response. We did this for about 10 minutes with no response. I ultimately got bored of nothing happening, so we decided to stop trying. We moved the planchette over goodbye and then put away the board. After the board was put back with the rest of their myriad of board games, we decided to play hide and seek, which to this day is still one of my favorite games. We decided to play hide and seek in their basement, which was huge and not to mention unfinished so it definitely had a bit of a creepy factor to it. I counted first. I decided to stand at the bottom of the basement stairs with my eyes closed, and then began counting aloud. The whole time I was counting, it felt like I was being watched, but I just assumed it was her making sure I wasn't peeking. Once I got to 10, I started looking for her. Ready or not, here I come. It took me a while to find her, but the creepiest part was the whole time I was looking, I felt like she was right around the corner. But every time I got to a new area, she was nowhere to be seen. The immense sense of being watched by something unknown, it hung extremely heavy in the air. When I finally found her, she was giggling, (laughs) saying that she was surprised I didn't find her right away. I told her it felt that she was in other spots because I felt a presence wherever I looked. This clearly creeped her out and her face went from giddy to extremely spooked. She then told me to run upstairs, so I did, my heart pounding with every step. When we got back upstairs, she told me that the reason she was surprised I didn't find her right away was because she could have sworn she saw me walk past where she was hiding at least three times. It's as if both of us were seeing and hearing things that weren't really there. Now, whether or not this was something that came from the Ouija board to have a little fun with our hide-and-seek game, we may never know. The whole ordeal was extremely creepy, but luckily, nothing bad happened. And the only thing I can say is that I don't think any paranormal experiences I've had since are a result of playing with that board, especially since I had been having those paranormal encounters well before I ever touched that Ouija board. Are you still with us? Good. We hope you've enjoyed our little sleepover, just as much as we've enjoyed keeping you awake. (laughs) <laughs> you can find October Pod on YouTube or our spin off podcast, October Pod AM, wherever fine podcasts can be found. And be sure to look into all of the impeccable Darkcast podcasts on the World Wide Web at darkcastnetwork.wixsite.com slash indie. Let me give that to you again. That's darkcastnetwork.wixsite, W-I-X-S-I-T-E, dot com, slash indie, I-N-D-I-E. 
On behalf of all the Darkcast Network, this is Edward October, wishing you a very happy Halloween. Stay spooky, mes amis.